DAB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Half past seven on this Tuesday morning. You're welcome along to OTB AM. It is Owen and Will with you right away through until 10 o'clock today. We are chatting with the directors of the brand new Pele documentary, which is dropping on Netflix this week. We're talking about the coaching of kids and the entertaining of kids during lockdown and what we hope to see in the new Living with COVID plan, which is set to be unveiled today. We've got Rory O'Connor joining us to talk about Mike Katz's press conference yesterday and the attacking philosophy being implemented by Ireland's rugby team at the moment. And Mark Lawrenson will be with us a little bit later on as well to chat Champions League. You can drop us a tweet, add off the ball or comment on the stream below if you happen to be watching on YouTube, if you're with us this morning. Willow Callaghan, good morning. Morning, how are things? Good. So if you or I were in the United Kingdom this morning, we might be thinking about going to a match in a few months' time. We might be thinking about going for a few pints after. We might be thinking about potentially going to a nightclub after going for a few pints after a game and potentially going to a gig the next day. I don't want to alarm anyone this morning, but is it okay to feel a little bit jealous of the Brits? It's impossible not to, isn't it? You look at the front and back pages this morning and it's like two different worlds due to the speed of the vaccine rollout. You look at the media in the UK who are talking about on the front pages potentially being back to cinemas and theatres with a small amount of social distancing by May for life to feel reasonably normal by the middle of summer, including major sporting events having capacity crowds like Wimbledon, potentially quite a few games in Euro 2020 because they believe if the 12 cities don't work, that England is ready to step in and host most of those games this summer. And they're also quite bullish about the idea of South Africa now coming to the UK as opposed to a Lions tour happening in Australia. And then you look at the front and the back of the Irish papers where it's the early reports upon the Living With COVID document which will be released this afternoon and into this evening. And from a sporting perspective at least, because of the slow rollout of the vaccine here, it's sports being hopeful about some kind of return in a limited scale by perhaps April or into May. And the feeling is that the country is going to take quite a bit longer compared to the UK uh, to get back to doing the things that perhaps we're missing at the moment. So it's really a stark contrast if you flick through the papers this morning on. Yeah, for sure. And I guess that adds a whole other layer of complication when you think about things like the GEA and what will happen north of the border as opposed to what will happen south of the border, what people are allowed to do, what teams are allowed to do as we get into the summertime. Like it's, uh, it's a fairly grim prospect that, that will be at a far accelerated place, in a far accelerated place than, say, there were 26 counties will be over the course of the next six months, say. Yeah, look, that came up in discussions around the GEA getting their documentation ready ahead of Congress. And they were saying that, you know, essentially they want to try and keep things north and south of the border at the same speed, whether that be crowds returning to games, whether that be training. But realistically, when you look at it and how you know quickly the vaccine has been rolled out in the Ulster counties so far, there's definitely going to be a, cha- a difference between the two jurisdictions uh, when we get to a point where the GA is back. And like all comments in the newspapers this morning on seem to be that the level five exemption will come back in for Gaelic games in this new Living with COVID document. So therefore, we now start to talk about four weeks probably of preparation time before the national leagues will get underway. And if the GA go with the plan which they were looking at last week, their hope is that the championship will be back in May and June. Well, realistically, in the counties in Northern Ireland, there's a possibility that they'll be allowed under their rules to have a considerable crowd at games while the GAA in the Republic of Ireland are looking at only having a few hundred people initially at least and with social distancing much smaller crowds than may be possible in Northern Ireland and even some of the BBC journalists were saying last week that you know Ulster Council are probably going to have to have a think about maybe not playing the Ulster football final in Clonus and maybe playing it somewhere like the athletics grounds because under the rules there they could potentially get more people in to watch so that's going to be a little bit of a headache for the GEA over the next few weeks and there is that possibility that Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland move at two completely different speeds between now and June at least. Is there a case to be made that more than just the Ulster Championship is played in Armagh uh, if, that, if that's a situation? <laughs> 
Well, look, it's in the pity case the park wasn't completed in time. It could have been the home of Championship 2021. But, um, yeah, there's not too many huge grounds inside Northern Ireland itself. But I'm sure uh, they can have a look at some of these, like Enniskillen and like the Athletics Grounds and maybe Nori uh, to host matches, which would have the possibility to at least have a reasonable crowd inside. And I wonder, will there be a frustration maybe within some of the Ulster counties too if they're held back in terms of the speed of their you know return to training and particularly outside of the elite end of inter-county that say if things are getting back to a relative normality by the end of may or into early june uh inside of ulster then does it become a bit of a concern for them if they're held back because of what's happening in the republic of ireland and i'm sure it'll probably spark a debate as well where you know once upon a time the ga were very good to soccer and rugby in opening up croke park for games if there's the possibility that you know things can be hosted in Northern Ireland, does a discussion come around the likes of Raven Hill and Windsor Park uh, potentially hosting games later this summer? Uh, maybe that's too thorny an issue, but I wonder if Northern Ireland ends up that far ahead, could it happen? At 7.36 on this Tuesday morning, we are addressing the issue head-on. Would you like to see an All-Ireland final played in Ravenhill, is the question uh, we're asking this morning. <laughs> Not really, uh, is, is what we're saying. Uh, but only 18,500 or so capacity is what Tommy is saying this morning with regards to, to Ravenhill and Windsor Park. Like, how, how much of this do you think is a little bit of a pipe dream from the English media this morning, saying we can take all your Euro games, place them in London, and everything's going to be fine? Like... Sure, they've got a massive head start on the first dose. And we should say that it is the first dose where, where their numbers really surge ahead of the, of the vaccine at the moment. Like, is it still going to be enough where they can completely just throw caution to the wind come summertime? Look, I think they're being bullish to a certain extent. And remember that this is a Conservative Party and a party being led by Boris Johnson, where his special advisor once upon a time went for a drive to test his eyesight. Like, you can't be entirely assured with this group that they're going to deliver upon what they're claiming. But they are freed up a little bit by the fact that they're not restricted in terms of the vaccines that they're purchasing like the EU are currently, which was naturally going to make the rollout a little bit slower. They've got the benefit that the vaccines, quite a few of them, are being both researched and manufactured inside the UK. And if you look at their record so far, they're making pretty steady progress in terms of getting people through that first dose. And when we get to maybe the Johnson & Johnson, where it could potentially be one dose if it gets approval, there is a possibility that the UK get the vaccination program completed by the middle of the summer. Everything that they are betting on at the moment, though, in terms of a return to normal, if we're going to use that most hated of phrases, is around the progression of the vaccine staying as fast as it is currently. And realistically, I would imagine all of our plants which are being put together are based upon the relatively slow rollout, albeit at least last Saturday, had to be a very hopeful day for Ireland where I think it was around 80,000 people uh, when the first of the mass um, centres were being opened up. And when those mass centres were open around the country, maybe this can speed up exponentially at that point. But our approach seems to be a lot more cautious. Maybe it'll work out that the UK are being overly optimistic at the moment and we won't be seeing full crowds at the Wimbledon final. But that very much does seem to be the plan at the moment. What else are we expecting from the Living with COVID plan today? sports-wise, Will, like you mentioned, the exemption to level five, that's probably a conversation that's been going on for the last little while and maybe the headline in terms of mm. sports news, COVID-wise, over the last little while. Look, I think um, a lot of sports are waiting and perhaps hopeful that later today that at least there'll be some kind of pathway and they'll know, first of all, they'll know how long level five is likely to last for. And at least from what I've read this morning, it's a case of, absolutely until Easter, with maybe a slight revision at that point, more likely into early May. So any sport that requires going down to level three or level two, quite a few of the mass participation sports where I feel for people massively. I know we're going to be talking a little bit later on, um, Owen, about the fact that young people have lost out quite a bit here in terms of not being able to see their friends, in terms of not being able to participate. And there's a huge worry, and there was quite a few newspaper articles at the weekend about it, that you know, some kids who were getting involved in sport and interested in sport could be massively turned off now by the fact that they've had pretty much six months of not being able to take part in organized sport, just in terms of for their fitness, in terms of um, for their social development, they've missed out on an awful lot. And I think a lot of those sports which have been on hold because of level five, some of which made the decision at the outset when we went into this second lockdown that it wouldn't be possible to return to play um, purely because of their mass participation levels, 
I'm sure they're wondering what the government plan is going to be in terms of an exit strategy where they can start thinking about competitions because you know some of the sports that had to go on hold they have been looking at the possibility basketball being one of them where they could maybe run some kind of shortened season or even from the point of view of people getting out to play a little bit of ball might be possible in the summer, even if it's not their traditional time of season. And I'm sure for junior rugby and those rugby leagues which are outside of the provincial system, I'm sure they'd love to get back and at least be able to say pre-season will begin at this time. Junior soccer across the country, which is a huge participation sport, a lot of their seasons never really got back going. So they'll want to know if they can run shortened competitions between now and the summer or maybe into the summer. And we could well see unusual homes for quite a few of these sports just purely because they don't want to lose a full calendar year. Mm. What's changed on the GEA front in terms of the exemption? I am not exactly sure. I think they're just hoping that it has been looked back and you know they've, the idea at government level is that they've revised um, them coming back. I wonder if it's maybe helped the GEA to own the fact that they laid out a plan last week which was to try and play inter-county first and Tom Ryan used the phrase it will be practical to do so because you're only looking at player numbers in the hundreds and up to around a thousand if Intercounty was to return and if the leagues were to be played in late April or early May and then into a championship, you're multiplying that number hugely and going into tens of thousands of people if you start to reintroduce club championships. And they were talking about the fact that they were going to be guided by public health advice as opposed to challenging it. I think the GA have been very clever with the way that they've approached it over the last while. It's almost like we're going to let you guys decide what we can possibly do. It's not like when the then acting CMO was being summoned to talks with the GA about the attendance levels last summer when we were going into August. I think they've been extremely humble this time around. You know, Tom Ryan also admitting that a lot of the problems around the GA having to shut down and some of the county finals not being completed was the fault of the GA family uh, for what happened with some of the outbreaks back in September and in October. So I think the fact that they've come at it from that point of view, and they've obviously done a lot of lobbying behind the scenes on this, it would seem that their exemption is going to be restored later today. That is certainly the feeling in all the reports that are in the newspapers this morning. And typically when it comes to these documents, I reckon between now and this evening, you will see vast swathes of it being leaked out in one way or another. It's very unlikely we're going to see a document printed later where there's been no flagging of the things that are inside it. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. I think you're banging the money there. The tone from the GEA last week was interesting. They almost put their hands up and said, for the failings of last year, we are sorry. And I think that's probably going to stand them in good stead over the next little while. We're going to be touching on this again, by the way, later on. Paul Kilgannon will be talking to us specifically about keeping teenagers active during COVID and what he wants to see in the Living With COVID plan later on today. That's coming up after nine o'clock. And we'd also love to hear from you as well. You can tweet us at Off The Ball or comment on the YouTube stream as well. Just a reminder that it is 7.42 on this Tuesday morning and you're watching OTBAM, which is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Phil Egan, good morning. How are you doing, lads? How are you getting on? Good. So what's happened this morning? Well, we're going to start with football. Obviously, more action tonight in the Champions League. Chelsea's turn. They play Atletico Madrid that game in Bucharest due to the COVID-19 travel restrictions. Chelsea unbeaten under Thomas Tuchel. Five wins, two draws. Weren't great at the weekend with that draw against Southampton. As far as Atletico go, They've kind of fallen off a little bit. Their lead at the top of the league has been cut to three points. They were beaten by Levante at the weekend, just one league win in four. So maybe now is the time for Chelsea to face Atletico. And the other last 16 tie tonight sees holders Bayern face Lazio. Bayern were also beaten at, at the weekend in the Bundesliga. Lazio have won seven of their last eight in Serie A, but they're 10 points off Inter in Serie A. Both those games kick off at eight o'clock. There's more Premier League action. Leeds are at home to Southampton. Leeds now, if they win, they would go into the top half of the table. That game kicks off at 6 o'clock. Last night, somehow, Crystal Palace beat Brighton 2-1. They two shots on target, and they scored with both of them. And Christian Benteke scored an injury time winner. I've watched Brighton so many times this season, especially at the Amex, manage to lose games that they should win comfortably. Uh, I think back to even... They lost 3-2 to Manchester United earlier in the season. They hit the woodwork five times that day. They lost by conceding a penalty after the full-time whistle had gone. Last night was just more of the same, where they battered Palace and they still lost the game. It's been the story of Brighton's season. Brighton versus XG has been the biggest rivalry this Premier League season. Yeah, well, obviously they started up front with Mopey, but you do have to wonder what 
Brighton would be like if they got a like a really clinical striker. And maybe that's something that will come down the line. And they've definitely changed their style from when Chris Hewton was in charge. And gradually you can see how they're getting better. They're a better footballing team. They're, now they're not conceding as many goals. I know they conceded two last night. But up until last night, they uh, the second best defensive record in 2021 in the Premier League behind Manchester City. So they have been, uh, and they've had recent wins over Spurs and Liverpool, but they just need to be able to put the ball in the net. And unfortunately, they can't do it at the moment. But um, yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely looking over their shoulders because they're just four mm. points above the, the relegation zone. And we know Fulham are on a decent run at the moment where Fulham are not losing that many games. They draw a lot, but they're, they're starting to pick up the odd win here and there. So. Brighton certainly not safe, and um, obviously Newcastle are part of that conversation as well. I suppose the the big news from the Premier League this morning is the the fact that up to ten thousand fans are going to be allowed into grounds from the seventeenth of May. Now this is all according if it all goes according to plan, but I suppose the fact that the seventeenth of May happens to be just six days before the final day of the Premier League season would suggest that some clubs could have up to ten thousand fans inside their stadiums for the final day of the season. And you think of, say, Manchester City, for example, they, they play in the, at home in the final day of the season. They could have a crowd there for their trophy presentation. When I say trophy presentation, obviously they haven't won the league yet, but um, I think in a few weeks we'll be referring to them as champions-elect. Some uh, big news, obviously, from the FAI yesterday was that Vera Pau announced her two-year contract and uh, she says she has unfinished business with this group of players and... Two more years, obviously, it's part of the 2023 World Cup qualifying campaign and obviously, hopefully, the reward is a place at that tournament after just missing out on a place in the playoffs for the Euros. That game away to Ukraine, still the one that did all the damage, as did the, the draw in Greece, conceding that late goal, but certainly the game in Ukraine. A bit like Brighton last night, a game Ireland lost. They didn't even have to win the game. A draw would have been fine, but they obviously missed a penalty in that game and somehow managed to lose. Now, there is actually action today. England take on Northern Ireland at lunchtime. It's the first game for England since Phil Neville left. So, Hega Risa will be the interim manager for that one. Obviously, Serena Vigman replaces Neville permanently later on this year. That game gets underway at half 12. You mentioned there about the GA. Things should be a little bit clearer for the GA later today with regards its playing calendar when the government updates a new Living with COVID plan. And speaking of COVID, the French Rugby Federation insists they won't be asking to postpone Sunday's Six Nations game against Scotland and Paris. 11 players and four members of their management team have tested positive for coronavirus. So nine of the match day 23 that beat Ireland uh, have tested positive and... France, the authorities there were worried about the games away to Ireland and away to England and lo and behold here they have a rake of cases so not, not a great not a great look for uh, the Six Nations at the moment but we should find out tomorrow if that game will go ahead and finally obviously Jordan Brown, what a weekend it was for him beating Ronnie O'Sullivan to win the Welsh Open, he's back in action tonight and uh, things don't get any easier he faces John Higgins in the first round of the Players Championship in Milton Keynes that match due to get underway at 7 o'clock Quick one before we let you go, Phil. Are Chelsea going through against Atletico? Ooh. I, I don't know. I, I'm not... It's a tough one to call because I mentioned there, obviously, Atletico have fallen out of form a little bit. Chelsea are beaten under Tuchel, but they haven't really played a decent team yet. Now, they can only beat who's put in front of them and it's a nice uh, situation for Tuchel to come into where they haven't had too many tough tests. And they look very comfortable against Southampton. And then Minamino scored and they're obviously chasing the game. But they still don't look like they have that cutting edge up front. He doesn't know what his best attack is yet. Um, obviously, the two teams tonight are probably going to cancel each other out. Both will play three at the back, I would imagine. So they definitely look a, bit, a lot more solid, but they're not scoring enough. And yeah, Atletico, maybe uh, I'd probably be leaning a little bit towards them. But the thing about this uh, tie is... Between the first leg and the second leg, Chelsea have some really tough games coming up. Obviously, they play United, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where, exactly where they're at in terms of can they get that cohesion up front because said he doesn't know. Is it? He's obviously started Tammy Abraham. He's moved Timo Werner in when he took Abraham off at half time. He put Mason Mount into a, a more withdraw, withdrawn role on the left. So these are all things that Tuchel has to work, work out at the moment. All right, Phil, enjoy it. We'll chat to you tomorrow morning. Cheers, that's.
It is 7.49 on this Tuesday morning. Coming up on OTB AM over the next couple of hours, we're going to be chatting to Rory O'Connor in just a moment of the Irish Independent. We're going to be chatting about Mike Katz's press conference yesterday, Ireland's attacking philosophy and their investment in youth. Football with Mark Lawrence is coming up at quarter past eight. We'll be con continuing that conversation around tonight's Champions League, a bit on Liverpool, and we'll be chatting a bit of Pele with him as well because uh, there's a brand new documentary out on Netflix at the moment about him. John Duggan will be with us at 25 to 9 and keeping teens active with Paul Kilgannon is our 10 to 9 piece this morning in the context of today's Living with Covid plan. Uh, that Pele documentary I mentioned uh, at 10 past 9 we're speaking to the directors of that. Uh, I sat down with them last week after watching it. It's a really good chat that's coming up after 9 o'clock and then Cahill Dennehy on a record-breaking weekend for Irish Athletics. So uh, that is how the scene looks over the next little while. As I say, you can tweet us at Off The Ball if you've got any questions, especially for Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent, who is with us this morning. Good morning, Rory. Hey, on, let's go. Good, thanks. So, my cat was up for media duties yesterday. Uh, he was asked, I presume, all about his attacking philosophy and trying, I guess, from your perspective, to pin down what exactly that is. Sorry, we're just going to go to a quick video clip before we actually fix your Skype line there. Uh, Andy Dunn was on Monday Night Rugby last night and he was chatting about that conversation about Ireland's attacking flow or lack of attacking flow and the problems, I guess, in their attack. Yeah, I think in a nutshell, yeah. I mean, it would be great. And, and let's, I suppose, let's try and quantify what, what we're looking for. I'm, I'm talking about saying this once or twice in 18 minutes. Okay. Done well. Okay. I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking about reducing our, our uh, possession to that disastrous, ghastly stuff that you read out at the start. One in 54 possessions results in an offload. That's horrific. It's an absolutely horrific stat. And what I'm talking about is an improvement on that, which is I don't think is asking for too much and I don't think it's suggesting we become the Harlem Globetrotters, and I don't think it suggests we lose attention to detail. I think it suggests we show a bit of courage, and I think it suggests we show some imagination. And um, yes, I would be deeply worried if we don't see some of it against a inferior Italian side. Andy Dunn there on last night's show, chatting to Joe Malloy. You can catch that back on the full Roby podcast. You can get that on the OTB Sports app. You can go on to otbsports.com as well. We're going to be chatting uh, with Rory O'Connor in just a moment because he was speaking to Mike Cat yesterday. He was talking about the attacking philosophy that Ireland have brought to the table. He says that the instruction given to the players is to see the picture. Uh, a lot of it comes down to the belief of the player that he makes the right decision on the back of the picture he sees kick, the run, the pass options, the basics in rugby. That is the message that Rory O'Connor, or that's why Cat was pushing yesterday. Rory O'Connor was questioning him in that, and he was writing about it in the Irish Independent this morning. That's basically the entire message here, Rory. There's a lot of responsibility that needs to be put on the shoulders of the players. Like, you're asking me about his philosophy. I still don't know if I could give you a, a firm answer as exactly what his attacking philosophy is. Um, it very much was about what's going wrong rather than what the bigger picture is, you know, because Ireland has scored two tries, one of which was really fortuitous um, in, in the 160 minutes of rugby so far. And yeah, yeah, like you're trying to tease that stuff out, but it's it's not, he's not very particularly forthcoming about it. So um, what you've read there was kind of an answer to what are you doing to fix what's gone wrong in the first two games? And it was very much, it's, it's kind of like it's up to the players. We're going to give them a framework and, and we are um, obviously here to help them, but they have to make the decisions at the time and they need to get better at trusting themselves. And he was also asked, you know, are you less prescriptive than Joe Schmidt's team was? He said, look, there is a structure there, but the game is, has shifted somewhat in the last five years. He said, There's only, we only had seven attacking lineouts against Wales in the entire 80 minutes. So having really good power plays and, and attacking um, weapons off, off, off those lineouts is not as valuable as it used to be. What players need to be able to do is counter-attack well, is to make good split-second decisions, um, when to pass, when to kick, when to run, which is very similar to what Andy Farrell said on Friday when he was asked about the same stuff as well. So, yeah, the onus is very much being put on to the players. The coaches are you know, are there to help them, but, but ultimately what they want is the players who, who we know are good from the, the, their you know previous performances and even the performance this season for the provinces and sometimes for Ireland in the pre-Christmas period that they need to see the space and they need to move the ball through the space and 
and this idea of heads up rugby, you know, I, I would have a fear that the players have been a little bit, have come up through a system that's been very much shaped from the top down by Joe Schmidt, that every coach in Ireland almost copied him because he was so successful and that all of the school's teams that are successful would, would have been very, very, um, had to play predetermined, that would, would have had a very strict script that they would have played and it looks very good when it comes off and now the they've been given a, a license at the very top level when there's less time and space and that's possibly where it's going wrong but yeah we didn't get really to the bottom of where the strategy is because you know like it was very muddled last Sunday week you know like the Gary Owen off first phase then you know they were sending key girls up for big contacts and you know when you should be sending your number eight that's, you know it just didn't make a lot of sense to to the kind of naked eye and even on, on review so yeah I mean it's kind of up to the players to bail them out and that's Almost what he said. When you said that, that Joe Schmidt philosophy had permeated all different areas of Irish rugby, was, was Pat Lamb's Connacht team essentially then an outlier? Is what we're seeing at the moment from Connacht and to a certain extent from Leinster an outlier from that drip down of Joe Schmidt thinking all the way through Irish rugby? Yeah, probably like Pat Lamb went to Connacht. And I think, I think Pat Lamb is someone who saw Connacht and, and the strengths and, and, and weaknesses of that province and said, well, we can't compete doing the same thing as everyone else. Like, you know, like our budget is far smaller, our facilities aren't as good. We've got to find our own way and our own identity. And like, Alam is someone that I would I would have hoped that the IRFU would have been calling when Joe Schmidt was leaving to see if he, was, if he had any interest in coming in and taking the job. But the succession plan was already in place and, and Andy Farrell has been given that task. And, um, you know, it's it, the... The, the, the way Connacht played, the way Connacht approached things, the, the, the manner in which they attacked at every moment, the, you know, the times down the sports ground where they refused to kick, even when everyone, like, even the TV commentators were screaming at them to kick the ball, like, that that worked for them, and it just showed that an Irish team can do it a different way, you know, that was kind of a ragtag bunch in many ways, of, it was obviously the core of Connacht players, but there was a, you know, a load of AIL cast-offs, there was players who kind of been around the block and have been picked up by Connacht along the way and he kind of forged a real identity there and it just you know you're right it did show like Leinster at the moment you know it it's probably more structured than that I think they they, they do put an awful lot of emphasis on unstructured play and training they have these Tuesdays where Lancaster will basically swallow the whistle and, and, and give them long periods of play where they just have to adapt are the less time to do that in training they just don't have the prep time that clubs do but that can't be an excuse either these are good these are best players have been the best players at every level of, of their development. They should be able to make, and I think this is what Andy Farrell and Mike had, who were brilliant players themselves, and I wonder if sometimes does that feed into them. They're looking at these guys who have been the best players in their teams the whole way up. They're the best players in the provinces. And they're saying to them, go and make plays, go and see the space, go and make the right decisions at the right times. And at the moment, our rest players are struggling with that. Uh, Rory, it's Will here. Just in terms of the kind of unstructured play, you look at last weekend, and I know a lot of people were frustrated on Sunday afternoon when it was the same squad as the week previously and that no changes were made. But you look at two players who are perhaps big name omissions in terms of their form, and two of them play in a very unconventional way compared to the Irish style, and that would be Jack Carthy and John Cooney. You know, we saw Cooney with a really good offload in Ulster's win on Friday night, and he was trying to recycle possession when he had the ball. And Jack Carthy was taking the ball into possession. He was taking control and driving Connacht on, particularly you look at that second wooden try where I think he had 11 possessions during it. Is the way that they're playing one of the reasons that they're not getting into the Ireland squad currently? It's very hard to get a read on why those two players are, are in. And, and I mean, I think what they did, what they, they, they picked the kind of a hierarchy where Conor Murray was first choice. And Gibson Park is a very, I think Gibson Park is a very good bench option. And I think he's picked as a bench option. And they've got Casey in there to learn and, and to experience things. But when they, when Murray went down, I know it was late in the week. Coon, like they were left with starting their bench option and bringing the kid onto the bench for a massive game. And whereas they've got Cooney was drafted in late and was sitting in the stand. And the game that they tried to play, where, where Gibson Park was kicking the ball an awful lot, suited Cooney down to the ground. They had Billy Burns starting, who's not the goal kicker at Ulster because John Cooney's a better goal kicker. I think you're completely right. I, th I think. For whatever reason, and they have had a good look at John Cooney. He was in throughout the first half of last year. It's actually, I think it's a year to the date since Ireland's last game in front of crowds last year in, in England where, where Cooney would have been involved. And also Luke McGrath, I think, is another player who is probably a more structured player, but is, is also very well able to run the game for nine and would be able to maybe take the pressure off those inexperienced tens. I, I've almost given up banging the drum for Cooney because I just don't think it's going to happen at this stage. They've obviously taken an opinion on him. And Carthy's almost the same. I mean, 
I'm told it's not because you know, of the Japan game. I'm told it's because they feel Ross Burns' kicking is better and Billy Burns' handling is better. I think what they would like is a combination of Ross Burns and Billy Burns because I think they're both, you know, Billy Burns' kicking is not as good, is not at the level. And I don't think Ross Burns' attacking player is, is, is at the level. I think Carthy, other than Johnny Sexton, if you're going to go for an established guy in his 20s rather than a, a young up and coming kid who I would have called for, but at this stage it's obviously not going to happen in this Six Nations. Carthy is, is the most most complete of all the packages. He's obviously very confident. He's you know he's been there. He's got a point to prove. I think you're, the way they like I, I think Ireland would have been better served with Cooney and Carthy playing together uh, against France than they were with with Gibson Park and, and, and Burns. But they almost went the way they named their squad at the start, and the decisions they've taken has almost nailed them to the, the players that they have. And he, and Kat did say yesterday we don't want to chop and change mid tournament, and I I can understand that because clearly they're not bringing in a flood of the new guys for this game because they're trying to build cohesion so that they can finish strong and earn the prize money that they need to keep the show on the road. Which you know it does have to be part of the conversation for all the you know I can sit here and play fantasy rugby and, and call for for different players to be called in. There is a reality for Andy Farrell that, you know, unless David Nusifora rings him and says, your job is safe, I want you to plan towards next season and 2023, which I don't think has happened. I think the imperative on Andy Farrell is go and win these games and he's trying to do it with the squad that he has. But I think it's a very it's, it's a very valid point that I haven't heard answered um, convincingly just yet. Yeah, and like I can understand that Andy Farrell at the outset of this tournament probably had 40 odd players that he saw as a core group if they're all fit that they're going to be the players that he's going to use but you would imagine there has to be a certain amount of flexibility for form here like you look at Coombs who has more tries than any of the rest of the forwards who are currently included even I mentioned Alex Wooden who's having a huge breakthrough season for Connacht and you saw the form he was in at the weekend if you're going to have players playing for their provinces and playing in form surely if they're playing that well they're the people you should be having a look at unfortunately this seems to be a reflection on the pro 14 and where the ireland coaches see the pro 14 um like coombs has played european rugby he was one that i I was surprised wasn't in at the start they brought him in for a week and took a look at him my understanding is that they feel like if these guys are not going to play and i think there's an argument for playing coombs because i think he is i I talked to stephen ferris for a piece i know you guys have him on later in the week but i i I spoke to Stephen ferris for a piece last saturday he reckons coombs has, has more in his tank than either Reese Ruddock or or CJ Standard in terms of his ability to change change pace, his dynamism. He actually reminds me of Ferris more than any other player we've had, you know, Ireland have had since. But they've taken a position that these players are better off being back in their provinces, playing week to week. And if and they seem pretty optimistic we will have a summer tour this summer. They can then change start that change then. I, I would have a concern that they're wasting a World Cup cycle here, that you know that it's going to be too late. And I I, I you know whatever about I, I, it's funny, I ha- I've only watched half an hour of Connacht. I watched, you know, I haven't caught up on a fully yet. In the first half an hour, Alex Wooden doesn't look like a guy who's shooting lights out. There's a couple of bits in there that you're kind of. I'm so watched, I've watched the first half an hour. Going, what happens here? Because Connacht are pretty, under a lot of pressure when I stopped. You know, and I'm going back to watch the rest of it today. Um, but yeah, like it, it, I think the two weeks of European rugby before this started being cancelled um, was a big blow to a lot of players who would have had an opportunity to play at, at, at the level where the Irish management feel like they're being tested at a level that's more similar to the test level. At the same time, this is an imperfect world we're living in. If these players, and I think certainly Coombs, Harry Byrne, um, and one or two others are the, the kind of players who are going to be playing in next year's Six Nations and potentially leading the charge of the 2023 World Cup, I think they should be in now. And I think particularly now that the title is gone, there should be a leeway to go and do it. They've taken the position that they want to win these last three games and finish fourth or third, which, as I said, like there's a million or two million in the, in the difference of prize money between those positions and in the financial situation there is. But I, I would question the, the logic that you can't win without them. I, I think that you're, you're on a bit of a loser if, if, if you're not trying them and you're kind of losing or you know producing middling performances with the same old, same old. You're really... You know, achieving mediocre results and learning very little at the same time. What Andy Farrell will say to that is that Harry Byrne simply isn't ready. And it's not just because of his age. It's because he hasn't played an awful lot of rugby over the past couple of months. He says that he hasn't had the opportunity to get fully bedded into camp and that it would be guesswork. And that's quoting from Andy Farrell last week. It would be a guess to throw Harry Byrne into the fold this weekend against Italy. 
Do you buy that? Do you agree with that? Do you think it's the right way to be approaching things, especially in the context of a World Cup cycle? Well, I don't think, like I think that's Andy Farrell's genuine position, and 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 mm. his. I think it, he he is feeling like he talked about relishing the pressure last week. He gave a great quote that I slipped my mind about. You know, it's kind of one that I think will be nailed up whether he fa- whether he fails or whether he whether he wins about how he embraces the pressure and. I buy it. I I do think that is his reason for it. I don't. I I think, like I am convinced, and I I have good reason to be convinced that long term he sees Harry Byrne as, a test out half, and he, would see him and Joey Carberry as probably the number one and two at the next World Cup, if Johnny Sexton doesn't make it. And I think they see a role for Sexton in that, but the, the two other players, are there. And obviously we talked about last time I was on. We we mentioned. Paddy Jackson and the RFU succession plan has been thrown off kilter by the fact that Paddy Jackson is unavailable and Joey Carberry has been injured for so long. And I accept all of those reasons. I think there is a time and a place for a coach to be bold and to take a chance on a player if that player is, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of an argument there. And I think it is true that if he had played against Northampton in that European game where he cried off late and played well and then kept the jersey over the next couple of weeks and probably the European games that happened. There's a scenario there where, where Harry Byrne will be in the match day squad, like Craig Casey is possibly going to be this week. That didn't happen because of like sorry, that didn't happen because of a, a stroke of bad luck for Harry Byrne in the warm up, and then COVID, you know, claimed a couple of games. Like you got to take sometimes you got to change the destiny yourselves. You can't be relying on provincial coaches who have very different goals and are operating on a different like they're on one year cycles like. Leo Cullen can afford to be very patient with Harry Byrne because he doesn't need Harry Byrne until next year or the year after to be starting those big games. Whereas Andy Farrell is is in the middle of a four-year cycle where he needs to win now as well. I think if you pick a strong team full of experience and you put Harry Byrne in the middle of that, behind a really good pack, beside Conor Murray, inside Robbie Henshaw, with a load of players that he's familiar with outside him, and you give him firm football against a team that Ireland beat by 50 points back, what was it, two, two months ago, and haven't lost it since 2013, and have been hockeying left, right, and centre pretty much ever since that game in 2013. Like we do have to remember, I know Andy Farrell said this is a dangerous game. This is Italy. They haven't won a game in nearly 30 games in Six Nations. They're they're decided to play loads of kids in the Six Nations. So Harry Burns going to be facing the lads who are younger than. Him. Like I, I buy it because I understand where Andy Farrell is coming from, but I'm I'm concerned by the conservatism of it. I think there should be more ambition and and forward thinking in it. While accepting the prize money and all of those things that are there, and I, you know, I heard Neil get outlined, outlined a very coherent and and and, and well thought out argument. I just disagree with it. I I would be. I, I don't think Ross Byrne and Harry Byrne are going. Sorry, I don't think Ross Byrne and Billy Burns are going to be the answer now or next year. I think it's time to skip a generation, as long as Carberry's not fit. If Carberry comes back this weekend, and we come out of this Six Nations window with Carberry playing for Munster, that changes the picture and probably allows Ireland to be more patient. And maybe they have information on Carberry that says, hang on a second, we think we're going to get this guy back. Let's let's hold off on the kid. We'll get through with the players that we have. You see, I think Sexton's in decline. I don't think he's as good as he was. And I think the players who are beneath Sexton right now who are in the squad are not of the level and are not going to get to the level. So why persist with them and give them the minutes and the valuable caps that you could be investing in a player who's younger? Just to bring this full circle then and to go back to what my cat was saying yesterday about heads up rugby and expecting spark from their players. Does that make it harder if you're Harry Byrne making your debut for Ireland being expected to provide that sort of spark? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it makes it harder, but it, he's a very confident kid. He's a very um, strong, like attacking player. Like I think he does have the, his attacking game already is stronger than... Billy Burns and Ross Byrne in, in that in the way he attacks line. I know we got a lot of criticism for his, his uh, not criticism necessarily, but people were pointing out the weaknesses in his game on, on Friday night and, and on a horrible pitch at Rodney Parade. But in the build of the Lancers' first try, he showed exactly what he does have in terms of the way he challenged the line. He obviously needs to tidy up the, 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 the kicking that went wrong in that game. He needs to be more prominent. He needs to be more forceful in, in terms of co- talk, stepping up and commanding the game. I guess his older brother was alongside him as well. And maybe there's like, that's probably a risk of the flag. That is, a, I don't have a brother. I, I've never, I, I can't really step into the shoes in that regard. But is he is he confident enough that he's going to tell Ross to get out of the way and, and, and order him around? How does that dynamic work? That is a, a strange one. Like, there are bits that he needs to tidy up. But I do think in terms of his attacking game and his ability to link and to throw um, good passes to play on the line, like, 
he's obviously going to be under more pressure at international level, but we won't know until he gets there. So, I mean, it is engaging in hypotheticals at this stage because he's not in there, he's not in the squad. He's playing against mm-hmm. Glasgow on Sunday. And again, that, that's like that. Lencer, oh, sorry, Ireland wanted to play against Glasgow on Sunday, play against Ulster the following week, and what's actually, you know, a pretty significant game for Leinster, even though it's in the middle of the Six Nations. And come out, they, I think they almost hope that by the time Ross Byrne and Johnny Sexton go back to Leinster, Leinster have a serious decision on their hands because Harry has been so good while they've been away. And um, the concern is that it's going to be too late for Ireland. But I, like, I think we would learn an awful lot about Johnny Byrne by putting him into this environment and challenging him to do that. And I think, you know, being backed by Andy Farrell with, with his arm around them saying, I think you're the guy for the long term. I want you to go out there. You'll make mistakes, but like, that's not, that's not, that's not your problem. That's on the 14 experienced guys around you to clean that up for you. But I think you're a match winner and you're going to do it for me. That's, that's the way I'd like to see him approach it. But unfortunately, they've gone a different way. Rory, the first couple of rounds of the Six Nations, thankfully, were fairly unaffected in the grand scheme of things by COVID-19. But COVID-19 is going to be a dominant story probably now until tomorrow afternoon when a decision is going to be made about France against Scotland. Like on the face of it, you're looking at almost a dozen people affected now inside the French camp. To me, it seems unlikely that game can go ahead this weekend. But the Scots, with their statement last night, are pretty insistent that they're planning for this game to take place on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, Scotland, I think, have 10 players who are based in England and the regulation, the international um, regulations in, in terms of calling those players up, are, are, you know, they're allowed to do it at this weekend because it's the Six Nations window, but the following weekend, those players are all required to go back to their clubs. And, you know, you get into very tricky territory for the SRU there. It's one of the drawbacks of of having, you know, players based abroad. Well, well there is some, um, you know, benefit of having, say, Stuart Hogg at Exeter and him, him winning. So yeah, no, there's a uh, there's major doubt. I think it's fair to say Ireland seems to have had a massively lucky escape in the fact that you know Rafael Ibanez, the French manager, has said that they may have picked it up in Dublin. They certainly they trained with the French sevens team the week before they came to Dublin. The sevens team, I think, are, are all in isolation or all probably coming out of isolation soon because uh, they all started reporting cases over that weekend or on the Monday after. Galtier was the first to report a you know a, a positive on the Monday. Um, Ireland have had four rounds of testing since, and they've all come up negative. And they um, they haven't they haven't been identified as close contacts because of the way that the stadium is managed, and they didn't spend much time indoors with them. It's probably just as well there wasn't many scrums on the day. Um, like that, that are, but it, I think Ireland can count themselves quite lucky that they're not in any way affected by this, and they seem to be okay going to Rome. But yes, that game is definitely in doubt. I mean, France were able to rotate their entire squad out and bring in 15 new players and go to England and nearly beat them in the Autumn Nations Cup. But even like the player I can't his name that, that they called up to, as a as a replacement yesterday, he turned up, they tested him, and he was positive because he, he had been 24th man in Dublin and travel as a reserve. So they're now play, you know, relying on players coming in from the outside who've been in the community, who've been in their clubs, and coming in, you know, and also that there aren't players who've caught it off their teammates over the last couple of weeks. They're preparing, I think they're doing kind of um, they're still training, but they're not doing full on. Um, you know, they're they're training with some element of distance and trying to contain what's whatever is in their camp as well. So that's obviously going to affect their performance if they do manage to pull this off. Six Nations is so big and so important and so valuable that you wonder whether they'll find a way. Now Scotland have said they definitely won't, but the you know, TV companies will surely have a role to play in this and saying. You know, we've paid it too much money for this to be a, a, a basically, a, you know, a, a cancel game that Scotland get five points from, um, which I think will be the scenario if we go off other other um, other tournaments. So, the most sensible solution will be to play the following week. But if if Scotland can't play ten of their players because of that, then they lose out, and maybe France will have to pay the, the English clubs for the Scottish players. There might have to be a workaround. Um, in that regard, I don't know, but yeah, it's very messy. I think it was inevitable that COVID was going to strike at some stage. You know, Fiji missed the, almost the entire Nations Cup, and no one really, you know, people got on with it possibly because Fiji don't have a massive media presence in, in this part of the world and, and aren't traditionally in our tournaments. So, kind of the show went on, but it was always going to be if one of the big guns got into this situation, it was going to get tricky. So, we, we're that's where we are now, and yeah, the decision the COVID or the, the the, the testing committee is meeting again tomorrow to make a, a final decision. I mean, you also have to wonder whether it's safe for the Scottish players to play against France this weekend. That has to be taken into consideration. Whether the Scottish, you know, like the, the safety of them going to the, st- the stadium, the stadium staff, all of these things. 
um, it's much bigger than that. And, and if there's any safety risk, you you would think the game will have to like just can't go ahead. Really. All right, Rory. Thanks, million for taking the call this morning. Appreciate it. Cheers, lads. Rory O'Connor there, rugby writer with the Irish Independent, and you can check out his work in the paper this morning. You can also check out Andy Dunn in the OTB Podcast Network or on the OTB YouTube channel. He was with Joe last night, and coming up over the course of this week, our build-up to Italy sees us chatting to Stephen Ferris on Thursday morning, and Ronan O'Gara and Alan Quinlan will be on air together on Friday morning's OTB AM ahead of Ireland against Italy. It is a quarter past eight on this Tuesday morning, and a packed show still to come. We've got the directors of the new Pelly Dock coming up after nine o'clock. Paul Kilgannon is talking to us about keeping teenagers active. But up next, we're talking football with Mark Lawrenson. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Saturday panel on OTB. And I find myself during commentary, sometimes a thread will appear in my mind and it'll be like a worm. You know, it's there. I know this might happen and I've got it ready to go and that would have been the nation holds its breath thing because i couldn't have scripted that penalty in genoa in 1990 and it just came to me in the moment but it came to me because of all that i had done beforehand and it was there ready to emerge at, at the right moment don't miss the panel every saturday afternoon on otb sports radio tune in 24 7 on the otb sports app Calling all builders, joiners, plasterers, and dryliners. Need advice on the right materials for the job? Consider it done. You need them on site and in your hand. Consider it done. You want access to over 10,000 products from the leading construction brands without having to start up the van. Consider it done. There's another way of doing things. ETAG. We talk with you to solve your problem and deliver what you need directly onto site. No second guessing, no seconds wasted. Click etag.ie. Check out the Boyle Sports app today for details on which football match is getting the no-lose treatment this week. Plus, browse through dozens of new player markets, all powered by Opta. Shots on target, left foot, right foot, headed goals, assists and more. See the Boyle Sports app for full T's and C's. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie 18 plus. OTB. AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Mark Lawrence is standing by. Let's go to odbsports.com first, though, just to have a look at the headlines this morning. So the lead story is with regards to Jack Grealish at the moment. His giveaway gets Villa players banned from Fantasy Premier League. It's been an interesting couple of days in that story. You can read the full piece on otbsports.com at the moment. Uh, Vera Powell spoke to Irish skipper McCabe after a controversial trip to Dubai. It will be the Haaland era, meanwhile, and it's not even close. That is Pat Nevin's take on Mbappe versus Haaland. Uh, Sports Minister meets Laporte as French COVID-19 cases swell to 15, as we've just been talking about with Rory O'Connor. And not entertaining, not effective. How can Ireland's attack improve? That is the big question on the rugby front. Over the past couple of weeks, otbsports.com is where you can get that or on the OTB Sports app as well. Tonight, though, the Champions League continues a doubleheader. We've got Atletico against Chelsea. We've got Lazio against Bayern. They both kick off at 8 o'clock. And Mark Lawrenson is with us to preview. Good morning, Mark. Morning. Let's start with Chelsea. What have you made of the start that Thomas Tuchel has made at the club? Well, it's good. Um, first and foremost, obviously, he's changed them defensively, so they're far more difficult to score against and obviously play against. It's just a fact now of, of, of working his magic in terms of scoring more goals. I mean, we had umpteen chances at the weekend against uh, against Southampton and unfortunately didn't take any. But no, he's uh, so far so very, very good. But you, you always get this with a new manager. You get this kind of bounce effect and I think he's chopped and changed the team a little bit, which is understandable because he wants to see uh, different players, what he's got in the squad and probably after two or three months make his decision as to how exactly he wants to play with the players that he's got available. Bit of tough love for Callum hudson Adai as well at the weekend. Subbed on, subbed off. Mm. A little bit of a public humiliation if that's not too strong. That can work for a player sometimes though, Mark, can it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's old school, isn't it? It, it, it's old school and it's, you know, it's done in front of the other players as well. And he's now under no illusions that, uh, you know, he, he, when he comes on, he, he can't work at 90% or 95%. It's 100%. And um, it's a little bit unfortunate because he, he's a young player and he's learning. And I'm not quite sure whether the manager would have done it with a senior player. But look, if, if he gets your reaction and he starts to play well and make 
uh, chances and assists and score goals, it's job done. Is that something that a new manager tends to do quite often, come into the dressing room, lay a marker down, let the players know who's no. boss? No, not, not really. I mean, you know, we, we live in a world where you, most of the time you can't criticise anybody because all the snowflakes will be out, as, as everybody knows. So I would think that, you know, Thomas Tuchel obviously will, will know him because he's been there, I don't know, for over a month or, or however long at the moment, and he's probably watched him in training and kind of thought, look, you know... Um, I could put my arm around him. Maybe he's tried to put his arm around him and, it, and it's not worked. So it's it's a bit like life. It's either kind of carrot or the stick. It's a donkey effect. And um, sometimes people obviously react to the carrot and other people react to the stick. And it looks like um, your man's got the stick, to be fair. Uh, in the context of tonight's game, then, and in, in the context of this tie against Atletico Madrid... It is yeah. a big miss, I think, looking at this team without Thiago Silva. Not just for any old team, but coming up against Luis Suarez. I'd imagine you want a wily old dog at the back to be able to go up against someone like Luis Suarez. The, the street smarts of Thiago Silva might be missed. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It would have been a wily old dog against a wily old dog. I mean, <laughs> and he's, he's been brilliant, uh, Luis Suarez, since he's there. They've got, obviously, Jao Felix as well, and... You know, the thing about Simeone's team is, is that, uh, that they have this saying in, in Spain, I think it's colismo, which basically means just, you know, a way of winning. If you remember when uh, Atletico won at, uh, at Anfield and Klopp criticised Simeone's team for the way that he played and, and he just turned around and said, well, look, you know, we, we just play to win and this is the way that it is, whether it's beautiful or whether it's not, it, it's all good. I mean, he's done an absolutely fabulous job there. But yeah, Thiago Silva will be missed. But, you know, I mean, Atletico, top of the league, La Liga, it's not the same league anymore as it was kind of three or four years ago. But even so, it's, it, it, it's a tough one. It really is a tough one for, uh, for Chelsea tonight. Mark, Atletico, a little bit out of form. They dropped four points against Levante over the last week in La Liga coming into mm -hmm. this, so maybe not the worst time to play them. But you spoke about Chelsea struggling to take chances. That potentially becomes a big problem against a Diego, a Diego Simeone coach side who've been so good defensively this season and going back in Europe for quite a few years now. Chelsea don't really have any of their forwards coming into any kind of form into this fixture tonight. No, they don't. They don't. And also, you know, we said that they've, they've chopped and they've, and they've changed. Um, so I know that's, that, that, that's a big thing for them. Um, look, if, if, you know, if they can get an away goal, um, obviously that, that would be a, be a massive, massive boost. But you're right, it might just be a good time to play Atletico Madrid because of the points that they've dropped. But very rarely gets it wrong, Simeone. Um, you know, he's just such a good manager. You'd, you'd kind of love to play for him, but you'd love to be, I say, you wouldn't love to be on the wrong side of him. And his assistant, by the way, have you seen the size of his assistant? Oh, my goodness me. Um, <laughs> he'd eat you for breakfast. So, um, listen, it, it, it'll need a good performance from Chelsea. And, um, you know, they, they will get examined in terms of defensively. And as you said before, without Thiago Silva, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big miss. Yeah, well, it is Atletico against Chelsea. Kicks off at 8 o'clock tonight. Lazio against Bayern as well is the other game tonight. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about Liverpool as well, Mark. It's obviously been another dark moment for them over the past couple of days, losing yeah. the Merseyside derby at home. Uh, one of the questions I had is, have you seen a plan B or some sort of innovation from Jurgen Klopp at all during this bad spell? No, there isn't There isn't a plan B because he just he just plays this way. He plays this, this pressing game and... You know, a lot of people at weekend say, "Well, he's got to change." I'm not. I'm not sure that he will. Um, you know, obviously, look, listen. Is it 19 central defensive partnerships? It's, it's just crazy. And while you can't blame the, the, the absence of, of, of Van Dijk and Gomez and Matip and all those on a regular basis, it, it is. It is a massive thing, and that's why I think the goalkeepers had a crisis of confidence a little bit. Um, you know. The, I mean, Quebec's just been thrown in. I feel, I feel, I bet he feels like he's playing at the Coliseum at the moment, and, and not at Anfield. So, it, it's a difficult one. But it's, you know, it's up to. I think the thing with Liverpool is, is do they change the style? I wouldn't have thought so. Would he change them defensively? I wouldn't have thought so either. Because um, I mean, they beat Leipzig last midweek. I think the defeat against Everton was always kind of coming, and you know. Klopp went on about the wind and all that, and I mean, he 
said many years ago, the wind is football's enemy. But Everton did a job on them, man. I think a lot of teams in the Premier League will be looking now at the way that Everton did this job on them and, and probably follow suit in the way way that they played. But it's everybody just got you just got to raise your game. You can't make any any more changes in terms of bringing fresh players in, as in you know the transfer window because that's closed. So it's just they've just got to work hard. And if they can get the front three firing, if they can get the front three firing then they'll win enough games, I still think, to get in the Champions League. Is that the barometer of success then for the rest of the season, Mark? Not yeah. only getting into the Champions League, but having those three firing because maybe their own personal form might intensify any talks about that front three perhaps being lured away from Anfield. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, the other thing I think which, which will be a bonus, and Diogo Jota can't be far away, he must be really, really close I know he's been training for a while, so he's really, really close to playing as well. He'll come, if he's available, all of a sudden those front three will look and think, you know, the regular front three think, oh, your man's back. Um, who, who's going to get left out? So, um, yeah, it's, 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 everybody needs pressure. You know, we, we always talk about this is when you, you've had a really successful season and you walk into the dressing room at the start of the next season, and you look around the dressing room and, and nobody's been signed who's played in your position, you kind of think, oh, that's all right. So you're a little bit in the comfort zone. But if somebody's in there, you're thinking, crikey, he could, he could take my place. And that, that makes a massive difference. So um, difficult to know what he'll do defensively um, <laughs> the, the weekend. Looks like Henderson's probably out for three or four weeks, maybe as well. So, so that's a blow. But sometimes, you know, you can oh, you can think so low, and you get to a stage where you think, you know what, sod it. Let let let's just go for it because let's take a chance because we're losing games anyway. Mark, you mentioned how Everton set up, and potentially other teams maybe looking at that as a template when they go to play Liverpool for the rest of the season. Just in terms of Seamus Coleman's role, mm. because he played slightly differently at the weekend, and he was tasked with first priority stop Robertson coming up and giving us problems down the left hand side, but yeah. also he pressed up high and won the ball in the uh, other half for Everton too. I thought that was a really good performance from Seamus Coleman in a slightly different system than he would have played in before. Oh yeah. Well, at, t at times he played with a four at the back, um, Everton, and at times it, it was five when kind of Seamus just took in. No, it was, uh, look, look, the outstanding thing about Everton's victory was the manager, you know, Ancelotti. He got it absolutely, totally right, of which Seamus was, was take loads of praise because of the way he did his job. But because he's an experienced pro, he realised that, you know, when, when Robertson was sat back defending, he could push up. So and that's something that he did. So I mean, he's you know, he, he did really, really well for them. And um, I can't, I can't give Everton enough praise for the way that they play. They just basically worked out every situation that Liverpool, uh, in the way that Liverpool played, and just completely negated them. And you know, even even down Liverpool's right, I mean, Trent didn't really get forward on too many occasions. So fair play to Everton. But yeah, well, well done to Sheamus, most definitely. And I guess that Everton win is all the more impressive as well if you consider that Alan and Dominic Calvert-Lewin were just coming back to fitness. Everton have dropped plenty of silly points, which Coleman was talking about after the game. You know, Newcastle at home recently, Fulham at home. They felt they underperformed against West Ham. To go to Anfield where they hadn't won since 1999 and to put in that type of performance deserves a huge amount of credit too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, you know, but talk about getting it right. I mean, you know, how much Rodriguez... You know the the pass was sublime, wasn't it, to, for uh, for his Carlson's goal? And Carlson seemed to enjoy the fact he was playing up front on his own for, for a change, rather than with Calvert Lewin. So they just everything they did, they they did absolutely right. Pickford didn't have to make too many saves, as well. Um, defensively, you know, Keane and Godfrey and those guys were, were outstanding as well. They just it was it was a, a top performance. Listen, it, it was always going to come eventually, and. Um, it was at the right time for Everton, obviously, you know, the, the wrong time for Liverpool. So um, let them enjoy it. I've had about 4,000 texts from all the blue noses that I know in the last few days. I should have turned my phone off. But, I mean, you can imagine some of the stuff they've sent through. But, look, good luck to them. They, they deserved it. And, you know, from 1 to 11, they played extremely well. 
Kevin Kilbane was on to me very soon after the game when I was praising yeah. Seamus Coleman and he was making the point that uh, you know we once upon a time were championing Matt Doherty when Doherty was in good form at the tail end of last season to be starting on the right hand side for the Republic of Ireland. Doherty got his chance and you know, he got an extended chance because of Seamus Coleman's injury uh, back in September but mm. the feeling would be now a month out from these very important World Cup qualifiers Captain Seamus Coleman is straight back into the team at right back now Mark. You would think so, um, and especially if, if, if you're going to play a back four, because obviously that's something that Seamus has done all his life. I mean, still a really, really good player. The, the problem for Seamus, as we know, is you, you reach a certain age and, and your legs start to go again, and he, he can't go up and down the touchline as much as he could kind of four or five years ago, but he's still very, very experienced, you know, knows how to play that position both defensively and offensively, doesn't give the ball away. And he's a, a real serious and, and fierce competitor. So I would have said, yes, that would definitely tick the box. Yeah, and it's at a time as well, I guess, where the defence have been rocked with um, John Egan's injury, Shane yeah. Duffy being out of form at the moment. So having his leadership back into that back four could be very important, particularly if there's you know a young player maybe like Darrow Shea starting in the centre of that defence. Having Seamus Coleman to his right is possibly going to be a big help for these qualifiers. Yeah, you can't you can't have enough experience, especially at, at that level, and and it's not just on the pitch, but it, it's also off the pitch, off the pitch as well, and, and, and the guys who come in relatively inexperienced look to the more experienced ones to help them through, and it's just a matter of, you know, a little word in someone's ear, an arm around the shoulder, or whatever, and, and trying to make it as, as easy as possible for these guys, because when they do come in, you know, it, it, it is nerve-wracking, because you feel the pressure, so if you can alleviate any of that pressure in any way, and that's for somebody playing alongside you that's extremely experienced, then it's a definite plus. As Will mentioned there, it is a month out from this Serbia game. I think it's a month tomorrow. And obviously mm -hmm. that John Egan injury last week, Mark, is, I, I guess that changes the conversation a tad around Shane Duffy. Maybe if John Egan is there, it's a, it's an easier benching of, of Shane Duffy not to throw him in there after the terrible time he's had this season. Does that, does that change your for, your mind if you're a Stephen Kenny about starting Shane Duffy or not starting him? Well, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's one of those, you can, you know, if, if, if you're having one of those seasons where, Every time you turn out, it's like you, you're making mistakes and you all of a sudden think you've forgotten how to play the game. So sometimes when you take that player out of that environment and take him into an environment where he's done extremely well, as in Shane Duffy with, with, with Ireland, then then the pressure goes off a little bit. So um, and he's, we know our experience is Duffy. We, we know we've never, ever let us down. He's been one of our most consistent players as well. I think that's just a Stephen Kenny decision. When he, when he looks at him and talks to him in and around training and, and, and works out you know, whether he thinks he's, he's, he's of the right sort of mindset to, to want to play and, and to be able to play and obviously to play well. But that, that'll be a, a Stephen Kenny late call, I would suggest. Yeah, and there's a, a full month of uh, chatting about that very thing, I suspect, coming up, Mark. Just a, a couple of other things just to, to mm. chat to you about. When the Champions League is written about at the moment, there is this shadow of the European Super League that seems to be lingering over it at the moment. Nobody's quite sure what might happen with that over the next little while, but one thing is for sure, if the Champions League is expanded and more teams are in it, we're going to have more football than ever, even next season. That is even after the season that we've had where there is football <laughs> being on every single night. I, I'm just keen to know, ha, have you enjoyed this season as a spectator and are, are you still no. in a place where you want more? No, I haven't. And I've, I've been to quite a few games. I've worked at quite a few games. No, it's just... It's, I mean, I think Guardiola said it on... Uh, I saw his interview before the game at Arsenal at the weekend, and he just said it's weird. Yeah, football is absolutely, totally weird. We've seen the results. I think it wasn't at the, at the weekend again, more more uh, away wins than, than home wins. So, no, we don't, we don't need any more football. This, this comes up every now and again. It, you know, the rich clubs are trying to get themselves... Richard, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong across Europe with with the the domiciled leagues, as it were, um, and also the you know the UEFA Cup competitions, and so far as obviously uh, Champions League um, and stuff. So look, no, we, it, it, enough is enough. And um, some, sometimes, you know, you can you can kill everybody's enthusiasm by having too much football. And I. I mean, I would watch nearly every single game normally. In the last couple of months, 
I'd probably only watch 50% because you kind of turn on and it's, it's a different stadium and there's no atmosphere, obviously. And you're kind of looking and thinking, do you know what? What's on Netflix? Yeah. Yeah, like that that's true. Like, I, I guess maybe enthusiasm for Brighton against Crystal Palace last night wouldn't have been at an all-time high after <laughs> months and months of action. Listen, like, listen they, they, have to, they try and sell that as the A23 derby or the M23 derby. And it's like, really? I mean, and I used to play for Brighton, and, and there is, it, it, is a, it is a proper derby, but not obviously, you know, Celtic Rangers, Liverpool, Everton. But I, I, I do laugh. And we've now got to have a, a title or a description before a game of what the game's all about. And it's like, for goodness sake, get on with it. Do you miss the idea of a match day, Mark? The, the sense of concurrent games just happening? It feels like it's one long week of game after game after game, rather than this sort of three o'clock Saturday bunch of yeah. games and bunch of excitement. Oh, my, my, my better half dies. She just says to me, when it comes to Saturday, she says, what, what we're doing today? And she goes, well, we can't do what generate. And she goes, Oh my God, she looked and she go. So there's football on from 12 until like nine at nine. I said, Yep, I'll be on the setting. And it's like, Oh, World War Three. But no, yeah, it's, it, it is. It is really, really worried. I mean, in many, many ways, it's fabulous because you'll be able to watch every single game, and that's great. And it's good for Sky and and, and other TV stations, etc., and companies. But as I said, yeah. I, after a while, it's a little bit like, really? Um, and I haven't seen that, that many outstanding games. Look, look, I just think the thing is that the, the best watch in the league at the moment are, are Leeds. I, I've watched every single Leeds game because they're just great to watch. Um, why, and the, because they just play the way play football the way you'd like to play, except obviously in terms of defensively because they concede an awful lot of goal, goals. But they just have a real go. And everybody, and after watching these, and then you watch another game, you think, "Oh my God, this is completely different," and it's not for the better. Maybe Leeds against Southampton tonight at six o'clock is the game to watch as much as the Champions League. Uh, Mark, you mentioned uh, maybe flicking to Netflix there. One thing that is dropping on Netflix this week is a brilliant new Pele documentary. We're speaking to the directors later on this morning on the show, but I just briefly right. wanted to get your memories of Pele, because it certainly struck me that we don't see enough of the guy. We see plenty of Maradona, and obviously with the two greats at the moment, we see plenty of them. But maybe Pele is a little bit of a distant memory sometimes. Like, I mean, from 58 all the way up to, to 72, and I'd imagine 72 in particular for you is just such a, a fond memory early in your life. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, um, I think, you know, when... when that Brazilian team and that game against England, which which obviously everybody in England would, would always remember, but that Brazilian team was just absolutely sensational. And I mean, you know, people talk many years on with with the cry fear about you know um, total football, etc. That 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 was the way that the Brazilians played. And, and when you think about Pele and, and watching what, whatever footage you ever see of him, he, he gets kicked to hell. Absolutely. I mean, in in '66. I would be nine, and I remember my, my dad had went to, to Goodison to watch um, Brazil play, and, and, and every time somebody tackled Pelé, they were just kicking him. It was like it, oh, it was just like assault, but he kept getting up and kept getting on with it. And, and when you looked at some of the goals that he scored, I mean, not just his dribbles and, he, and his finishing, but, you know, in the air, he was absolutely brilliant. He had this kind of leap that came from nowhere. You'll always remember the Gordon Banks save as well, which was was sensational, but also the way he played the game. If you remember, you know that that, that game against that game against England when he played against Bobby Moore, and, and straight away at the end of the game they put their arms around each other and they had a, like a real fantastic battle. And those days are gone. But oh, Pelly was just unbelievable. He scored over a thousand goals. I mean, what's all that about? Yeah, incredible. 1970, not 72, obviously, is what I yeah. meant there. Like, that that's obviously no. held up as the one. But uh, as you mentioned there, the way he was kicked, 1966 almost seems to me as uh, one of the most important moments in his career because it kind of indicates how genius can still survive even in the midst of this idea of football being all about the brute force and the ability to kick your creative and flair-filled opponent. Well, you know, I'm not being funny. In, in, in those days, in, in the really big game, um, after half an hour, the ref threw the ball on because everyone was just taking lumps out of each other for the first half an hour. It's almost okay, boys. We've had enough of that. Let's you know try and play football now. 
still, <clears throat> as a striker, to live in that era where you got, get away with absolute murder. And you, <clears throat> you ask a lot of strikers in the kind of, certainly in the 70s, maybe early early 80s, and it, it was a known fact that you could take a lump out of a, a striker in the first 20 minutes and get away with it. You just get a warning from the referee and it just write no more of that. And that's, you know, he, he lived his life with, with, with all of that. And when you think what he did in, uh, was it in Sweden when he when he first really burst onto the scene? And, and, and you think, oh my goodness, what would he be, 17? Some, something, yeah. like, something like in a, in a World Cup? I mean, you know, tough. transport that to today's way and today's football. Could could you? I mean, Sky Sky would have self combusted every time they watched Brazil and Pele, <laughs> wouldn't they? No, they would have done. They'd have run out of superlatives. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he probably uh, a, a little bit easier for them to plug than the A24 derby. Let's uh, put it that way, Mark. Twenty-three, uh, right. A23. Oh God, my apologies, my apologies to, to all our uh, Brighton and Crystal Palace fans listening this yeah. morning. Uh, Mark Lawrence, thanks a million. Pleasure. Cheers, uh, Mark Lawrence, and there on the line talking everything to do with football as ever. Uh, there is Premier League, there is Champions League tonight. Six o'clock is kickoff time in Leeds against Southampton, and eight o'clock is kickoff time in the two Champions League games. John Duggan, good morning. Owen and Will, good morning. I've been to that A23 derby. It is a brilliant, brilliant atmosphere. Uh, sorry, when was this? Um, this was about a year and a half ago at Selhurst Park. And uh, yeah, really, really, really edgy in a good way uh, before the game. Um, I actually got off a stop after around Crystal Palace and then I walked up with the Brighton fans uh, to Selhurst Park and... and Crystal Palace, Sellers Park, a real old school ground, and uh, it was a good match, a one-all draw. And I remember, uh, remember the eagle, the little eagle in the middle of the pitch, and everything, and the cheerleaders, and everything. It was really, it was a good, a good evening. Uh, we were chatting a little bit about Pele there with Mark Lawrence in a brand new documentary this week. He was a man who came up quite a bit in your World Cup revisited series last summer. I'm lucky enough to have an autograph of Pele um, signed in my name, and I didn't. And um, he was at a dinner I was at about 11, 12 years ago. So I got Pele's book and uh, to John from Pele, so um, I'll always treasure that. And like, like most people, I didn't see him. Um, he came up, obviously, in his uh, amazing uh, burst onto the scene as a 17-year-old in 1958 when he won that World Cup, 5-2 win in the final. Um, and that was a World Cup in Sweden, if I recall. And European, mm. uh, South American teams generally don't win your, your World Cups in, in, in Europe. And then uh, 62, he wasn't as, uh, maybe as dynamic uh, in terms of dominating the tournament as, say, Garincha and Vava were. 66, as we've spoken about there, he was kicked, kicked out of the tournament, effectively. And then 1970, he came back for that glorious, it's only 29 years of age, that glorious, uh, amazing tournament that Brazil played and the 4-1 uh, win over Italy in the final, scored the header. Um, there was that was that moment again that I think it was against Uruguay where he nearly chipped the keeper from uh, inside his own half. So uh, the, the the thing about Pele is we never saw him play because he never really he didn't play in Europe. Uh, he went from what Santos to the New York Cosmos. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of the player um, rather than the myth uh, that that uh, has become. Um, obviously, 1958 is is where, like I remember speaking to Ron Jones, the former commentator on, on Today FM, and he was always very much of the view that Pele was the best he'd ever seen. It's very difficult to compare, but sometimes it's very difficult to uh, make an argument, as Barry Davis was even saying on the commentary panel the other day between, say, Maradona and Pele, if you've not seen these guys uh, completely close up. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And that idea of the comparisons is going to be a big part of our chat with the directors later on, because... They're very. They're not keen at all to make those comparisons, but it's it's sort of impossible to avoid at the moment. Uh, John, we wanted to talk to you about Spurs in just a moment, but first of all, tell us what's going on. Well, Atletico Madrid Chelsea should be really good tonight, lads. An eight o'clock start uh, in Bucharest, so it's a neutral venue for this uh, Champions League last 16 first leg tie. No Thiago Silva for Chelsea. Uh, Luis Suarez obviously um, is now the the resurrection man in terms of football. In uh, La Liga, scored 16 goals, though they did lose their last game to Levante in La Liga Atletico. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of match we're going to have tonight. Five wins and two draws for Thomas Tuchel. Has he really been tested yet? Probably not. Um, the other match is Bayern Munich, the champions against Lazio. We also have Leeds against Southampton in the Premier League at 6 o'clock. So that's what's going on tonight in terms of football. 
Fans allowed back into stadiums in the UK from May 17th under this roadmap from Boris Johnson's government. We will see the Premier League end on May 23rd. Are there going to be integrity issues? Say, if Fulham are playing Newcastle on the last day, did fans at Craven Cottage, would that be a problem? But you're thinking then, all lockdown restrictions lifted in the UK on June the 21st. You've got the European Championship final. At Wembley, you've got the Open Championship, you've got British Grand Prix, horse racing, and of course Wimbledon, where you've got 42,000 people a day. Here, it's going to be a lot later, and we'll have to see if that roadmap that the UK are saying is going to come to pass. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the French Rugby Federation, uh, just before we get to that, actually, Vera Pau uh, is going to lead uh, the Republic of Ireland women's team into the World Cup, sticking with soccer. Uh, for the next two years, she signed a new deal. Should have qualified for the Euros, um, messing up against Ukraine didn't help. She's also spoken to Katie McCabe, who uh, took a trip to Dubai around Christmas time, which Katie has apologised for. And Pau says there's more to be done in terms of her role. Changing now would be a shame for them and for myself. Um, I feel that we're just on the way. Also because of COVID, of course. We had only uh, the qualification matches. We did not have any uh, friendlies. So we did what we could. And within that, I think that we're probably the only team that every time was, gr was growing a step. And uh, we don't, uh, we've not seen the ceiling yet. So it's indeed, I think, unfinished business. Yeah, I think that's a right, that's a good, good way to say it. Now, we will know tomorrow what the situation is regarding the France-Scotland Six Nations game scheduled for Sunday because 11 French players have tested positive for COVID-19, including their captain, Charles Olivon. Um, so the game could be rescheduled, if that was the case, as soon as possible, they're saying. So it wouldn't be this weekend, but the weekend uh, afterwards. But that could cause a problem for Scotland then with club and country um, tug of war. So remains to be seen what's going to happen but not ideal if the match goes ahead not ideal for France I mean the best team of the Six Nations so far but 11 positive uh, tests within their squad now Ireland play Italy in Rome on Saturday a lot has been spoken about regarding the lack of attacking prowess and um, zip from Ireland and the lack of offloads in the team and Mike Cash is the attack coach and he says we will see in a cutting edge if you believe that you're going in the right direction and you believe that players, you know, and things take time to, to get ready. And I know we don't have a lot of time at international level and the expectation is, is, is no higher than from Andy and the rest of the coaches in terms of how we want to play the game. Um, winning at this level is ultimately the, the be all and end all. Um, so, you know, from a pressure point of view is I see it as us continue what we need to do to make the players better, to make them to understand um, how we want the game to be played. Um, and ultimately, we will see the rewards on the back of it. And uh, that's going to be a, a must win. And we'll expect to see guys, a team that uh, might be quite conservative uh, from Andy Farrell. But I suppose as points difference comes into play, uh, you know, the, the amount of prize money and uh, finishing as high up in that table as he can. We, got, we nearly need to almost reset and think we've got three matches now and try to win all three of them. Mm, that, that's certainly the view of Andy Farrell. It seems to be uh, the view of Mike Cat that giving youth his chance is all well and good as long as it contributes to getting the win. These next three games are ser seriously viewed as very, very important games from the Irish coaching staff, it seems. Uh, John, we wanted to ch chat to you a little bit about Tottenham Hotspur. Like we, we feel that we've picked the time, which is the lowest ebb for them this season, to chat to you, and then another week happens, and then another weekend of Premier League fixtures transpires. Is this now the lowest ebb of the Jose Mourinho era at Spurs? Yes, I was like up to Joe had this really interesting stat that came out after the West Ham defeat. Uh, 50 league matches in charge of Spurs now. Jose Mourinho, 81 points. His first spell at Chelsea, 126. His second spell at Chelsea, 114 from 50 games. Uh, at Inter, 113, at Real Madrid, 123, at Man United, 95. It is a decline in terms of Jose Mourinho's first 50 league games at any club. Spurs is the worst. They were top of the table not too long ago, the months before Christmas. Uh, now they're ninth. Um, he was brought in by Daniel Levy to win a trophy. They could win the League Cup. They could win the Europa League. I think the Europa League is much more important because you get a Champions League qualification place out of that because they're not going to get top four. And I watched the West Ham game. Bale was the best player. So you've got to play Bale now. You have to, like, Bale um, has to play. He has to play against Wolfsburger. He has to get his match fitness up. He has to play Bale now because he was creative, he was lively, and he added something. 
And the problem with Spurs is and with Jose's teams is Jose has always built his teams around a solid defence. At the moment, the defence is porous. The goalkeeper isn't certain. Eric Dyer, he put the chips in his, in his blackjack hand on Eric Dyer and it's a losing bet uh, at the moment for, for Tottenham. And uh, defensively, they are poor, five defeats and six. And that was the, always the, the, the way Jose set up his teams. So if, if, you, if you can't fix the defence at the moment, I don't know who he's going to get in the summer if he's there that long. Um, you have to mm. go and, and try and attack and win games by scoring more goals than the other team. And that's why Bale has to play. He's on 250 grand a week. He has to play now. And, and he has to play because he provides a better option than maybe Bergvine or Lucas Moura or whoever is going to be within that three behind Kane because Son will be one of them. Mm. It seems as well that he's starting to lose a dressing room or a report that the players are unhappy with training sessions. They think he's too defensive. It, like This is obviously one of the things that tends to happen before every Jose Mourinho departure where the players start to get irked a little bit, that he is this great totemic figure when things are going well, but I presume things get very grating and very negative when things aren't going so well. Yeah, well, you wonder what is, like, if everybody watched the Amazon documentary and his mood is quite chipper, it's quite, quite upbeat, and um, you could even feel before Christmas that there was a sense that this thing was working to a degree and he had his mojo back, but it's, it's the speed and the... Uh, uh, alacrity, if that's the word, um, of the um, of the decline, which is which is alarming. But that the, but there were signs within the early performances when they were losing leads against West Ham, uh, against Newcastle, against Crystal Palace, against Wolves. They kept on losing winning positions, and that was always a very worrying thing because they were too much in a straitjacket of defence. But now they can't seem to transition now to being an attacking team, and they can't gel in that regard. So that is a worry. And I was looking at Pochettino's record at Spurs. Um, fifth, third, second, third, and fourth in the Premier League. Got them to a Champions League final. Didn't win any trophies, but did everything else under the sun that he could do. But also, the most important thing, he played great football. He played attacking, pressing football, and really exciting stuff. And Harry Kane banged in the goals. They got 86 points in 2017. Normally enough to win any league. And now Spurs have, what, 36 points? Like, it's, it's very worrying. And it's just, like, he, Jose's looking in a way for two reasons. Daniel Levy wanted him and not Pochettino. He didn't give Pochettino the money. Paul Mitchell, who was a really big scout and, and recruitment guy, left the club as well. And he wanted Mourinho win because of the, 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 the sparkle, the glitter about Mourinho. Mourinho did win the league at Chelsea in 2015. Maybe they thought, OK, Mourinho had a tricky time at Man United, but he'll be the man uh, to... to who would have turned down the job maybe 12, 13 years ago that will lift us to former to further further glories and, and actually win trophies because he's won 20. Or, so I can understand the rationale at the time, but now it looks like Mourinho's career. Like, will Mourinho ever manage a, a top club like Real Madrid again? Hard to see it. Like, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if this is this is really a really pivotal time in Jose Mourinho's career because if it doesn't work out now, he's into international management with Portugal or he's going to be a TV pundit. Like these are the these are the options that are like ahead of him if it doesn't work out at Spurs and it has to start working quickly. He might get one more season to, to have a give it a go at it, but that could be a season with fans at White Hart Lane and fans on his back. Two reasons: there is, like it's okay if you play poor football or ugly football on the eye if you get the results, but if, if you're not playing great football and you don't have the results, then you got a problem. And that's why people are looking at Nagelsmann, Brendan Rodgers. Uh, all of these managers. But with Brendan Rodgers, like the, the owners of Leicester and Spurs are worth both six million. Would you, if you're Brendan Rodgers and you're well paid and Leicester, you know, you probably have the run of the show there, want to go to Spurs anymore? That's the thing I've, I'm kind of thinking percolated in my head this morning. Um, also, Spurs have nearly more debt than any other club in Europe because the stadium, they're over a billion in debt with that stadium. Now, their short term debt is only about 350 million sterling, but their long term debt is like over a billion. And there, therefore, you're worried about, do they have to sell Kane? Will Kane mm -hmm. go? And Kane is the England captain. He's 28 years of age this year. He wants to win trophies. And he wants to win a league title or a Champions League. And he knows himself when he's 31 or 32. Will clubs want to buy Harry Kane? So it's a worrying time for the club. Yeah, that's for sure. John Duggan, great stuff as ever. Thanks a million. Right, guys. On OTB Sports Radio today, from midday, you're going to be able to hear the Jack McCaffrey interview with Bernard Brogan on the Bernard Brogan pod. That was episode four. From one o'clock, OTB Gold is Joe in conversation with Ruby Walsh. The Dadcast then is on OTB Sports Radio from 3 p.m. before we delve into the madness that was the Mount Rushmore of County Roscommon. You don't want to miss that at four o'clock.
And then from 6 p.m. OTB Gold is Wexford 1956 with Ned Wheeler and Art Foley. Right, at 8.54 on this Tuesday morning, we're talking about Ireland's plan for a return to sport. And we're asking, can we, what can we do to help keep kids and teenagers active over this time? Uh, there are a couple of different answers to the question around kids and a couple of different questions to the answer, uh, answer to the question regarding teenagers. And we are going to focus on teenagers this morning with Paul Kilgannon, who is creator of the Carver Coaching Framework. And he's also an author of a couple of books, Be the Best You Can Be in Sport, a book for Irish youth. This is his most recent one. And he's also author of Coaching Children in Sport. Paul, you're very welcome to the show. How are you getting on? Thanks, Ron. Happy to be here. How are you? Good, thanks. So we're going to see the government's Living with COVID plan a little bit later on this afternoon. And I guess as someone who is a teacher, first of all, and a coach of children and teenagers, what do you want to see in this plan? Um, I think for, for the if, we, if what you, I think what do the young people want to see? I think the young people want to see some clarity. I think the young people want to get back to sports. I think they want to meet their friends, and um, I think they they really value sport and they know what what it is to live without it. And uh, I think they want to see from the government that they've been listened to and heard, and um, in a safe way. I don't think anyone's looking for anything crazy, and um, I don't think anyone's looking for a rush back to competition or a rush back to anything. I think anything is better than nothing. So I think um, they need to be given some sort of direction. They need uh, to understand if they're making a sacrifice, how how is it helping? And if it isn't particularly helping, can we go back and play? And I think that's what they're, the very basic stuff I think they're looking for. When it comes to teenagers over the past year or so, those that have been involved in sport, I presume that there's two different elements to this. There's, first of all, the teenagers that love their sport, that just want open fields to be able to play whatever they want to play. And then there are the teenagers who perhaps aren't so interested in sport, and it is about keeping them engaged, which is a nigh and impossible thing to do when you aren't actually getting any face-to-face -face contact with them. Yeah, I think um, I think Christy O'Connor wrote a pretty good article there with the Echo during the week, and he said that uh, and, uh, he quoted an Aspen Institute study that reckoned we'd Unless we have drastic intervention, we lose 30% of young people um, between 6 and 18 in sport because of the pandemic. So there was a huge challenge um, in coaching. And, and I suppose I've been in this coaching um, corner for a long time trying to espouse the virtues and values of, of sport to society, maybe before the pandemic, definitely. So I've always seen coaching uh, as a key driver of, of a good society. So I think the challenge is going to be on coaches ever more and the challenge has been on coaches in the last year to try and innovate and uh, i suppose educate a bit inspirate a bit and entertain a lot because people are missing i would have talked to a lot of my lads yesterday uh, i was under 16s and it's the connection they're, they're, they're missing they're missing that connection i think uh, brenny brown said uh, you know we're hardwired to connect and um, it gives purpose and meaning to our lives you know without the suffering and so i think people are experiencing that so that's our challenge you know has been our challenge for the last year as coaches, try and innovate to bring everyone with us at some level. But I think, uh, you know, I think uh, Lee Moggan, um, I think he was on the show while ago, said, if we get coaching right, everybody, everybody has a chance. So I think we can we can do something for everyone. And we can in the past, in the, week, in the, in the last year we have, and we can continue to do it. How have you been getting towards the place where that engagement with that 16 year old is the best it possibly can be? Um, it's been really, it, it's been hard, um, but all things are hard, sport is hard, so that's fine. So we had to scratch our heads a lot. I think one of the first things we did was um, we drove around, I'm involved in hurling, and we gave every boy two, hurl, uh, two balls, and we gave them um, a practice diary, and that was our first kind of what we were trying to wow, I suppose, them into action. I think there's three things you have to ask yourself, really, when, you, when, when you're a coach in this. You have to ask yourself, when all is said and done, what do you want? You know, to be said about how you supported your players in, in, in this period. And I think you have to ask yourself, you know, what are the, the behaviours we're trying to drive or what are the, you know, what do we want them in, in doing in this period? And then the third thing would be, how do we make them behaviours or them, them things um, more attractive to them? So we have done lots of different things. We would have had re weekly reading. Uh, we would have had, uh, so yesterday they got... Um, the New Zealand mental skills coach, um, an article from him. We would have watched games together. Um, they would have had worksheets to, you know, to engage with as they watch games. We would have sent documentaries. Uh, we watched Richie McCaw together, and then we fed back through. 
and the learnings from it. So feeding back that interactive piece and the learnings. Uh, we've had uh, guest speakers in, um, we've had Michael Day in on nutrition, um, Damien Young is the head researcher in the demand of hurling, we've had him in. Uh, we've had a lot of other people in to talk to them as best we can, Eddie Brennan, Barry Smith and uh, Dave Morris, loads of different people in to talk as best we can. Um, we have given them um, deliberate practice videos. Uh, we have uh, a guy that helps with S and, uh, S and, uh, athletic development, Neil O'Toole. He, they have his phone number, they can ring him, uh, they have my phone number, they can ring me. There's been lots of innovations. And I suppose one of the challenges we've had is not to be putting more on top of more because, um, and that's a hard one to navigate and it has. So there has to be that social element to it. So um, we've started looking at different projects, breaking, they're going to get a new project tonight, we're breaking them into teams and there's going to be challenges and we're going to try and score them challenges. I think uh, well, it's not a, an exclusive, but we're going to be tonight, they're going to be looking at uh, high performing teams and they're going to have to research and present back to their their buddies and, and learn to work together. So, so, so this is all, teams. sorry, but, so this is all 16 year old boys, Paul, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, it, yeah. that's our challenge as coaches to try and inspire and try and, and, and move them to action. That's the big challenge of coaching, you know, it's, it's, it's a big job, it's a big order, so yeah. And how have you found the engagement? Like, I, I'm sure that there's probably this stereotype out there that if you give a 16 year old boy that sort of article that you're talking about there, where it, it gets into the nitty gritty of, of coaching and obviously will have a positive influence if they do read it. Is, is the engagement good? Is everybody willing to engage with everything that you're sending their way? Well, we can only have improvement by degrees, so nothing is perfect, you know, so we understand that someone, you know, we'll have quick responders, we'll have aggressive mm -hmm. responders, we'll have not so, so it's, it's not a game of perfect, coaching isn't a game of perfect, but I think a lot of the interactions that have come as, uh, uh, in COVID have probably, you know, what happened before was probably important too, so was that environment for learning, uh, was the, you know, I, we, I, well, Fern Gambetta is a mentor of mine, he said words create images and images create action. So the words we would have used pre-COVID, like, you know, we would all say we are aggressive to learn. Learning is a, le a sport, is a learning competition. And uh, we would have, have had little team values, which I think are standing us now, you know, uh, relentlessness and uh, things like stuff that we want to stand for as a team. So that foundation of, of what a, a team was, we tried to lay it over the last couple of years. And, and that's really important that, you know, all um, the, the pillars of the player we're trying to build physically, technically, or tactically are, are layered upon a foundation. And, and that foundation when they're young is really important, values, char uh, character, and, and, and uh, behavior. So I would like to think some of the work we did before COVID is standing to us now. And uh, we didn't rush to, like in, in developmental sport, we, we don't rush to performance. We, we put in a foundation. So. Uh, we might not have done it right all the time, but I think we, we put in a good, so our lads, I would like to think it would have a, a value on learning. And then we're also trying to work on different things. Last week, we interviewed three of the selectors. They were probably three of the, the club legends. We interviewed them, and one of the boys said to me after, uh, it, was, it was Ronan Welch, he said, I never knew he played for us. He played for Karen Moore, and Ronan, Ronan captained our team in the county final. So uh, that, that was, a, you know, and that was, it was a wow to me after. So we interviewed three of our, our mentors, and most of the boys just uh, didn't, didn't know anything about. So there's, there's ways we can innovate, connect it back, uh, route them to where we're from, what we're about. And it is a tall order. I, I don't say any of this, um, this isn't easy. But I suppose the challenges we're preparing our players and to face in the future aren't going to be easy. So I think um, how we lead now and how we coach now will define us moving forward. And uh, that's what I'm trying to help with. Paul, you're talking about you know innovating to keep the young kids interested and engaged during all of this. Over the last year and in all of these innovations, has it changed your philosophy or your ideas as a coach over the last year as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I've really learned. I always talk about we know most of this stuff, then we forget it and it becomes you know becomes unimportant again until we get a kick up the bum and then we you know we, we go wow. But yeah, absolutely. So sport is a vehicle to teach people how to be good at life and that's what it is and um, I, I've known that for a while but I keep forgetting it every so often so now I really understand the values and the virtues of sport I suppose I talked to five my, my lads yesterday and about what they're experiencing in it so they talked about losing their identity losing their connection with friends and um, I think there's a lot of homework coming on them all the time yeah and then they don't have the outlet so 
we always have to keep the most important thing the most important thing and i really think that there's an opportunity for coaching and sport and sport in ireland to reimagine the the purpose of sport you know and they go to the pitch you know to learn and to develop uh, you know so in my club we have four things we want the purpose of our club is a place to play hurling make new friends reach your potential and feel like you belong we need to nail that all the time when we rush to performance and think it's about winning and all that uh, we go to a kind of a we dehumanize it so we need to keep that human spirit in it and think of think of the people because from this um, value based and character driven and behavior driven environment will emerge um lots of people will give them the opportunity to access the game at a, at a high level and as a coach i'm learning that more and more all the time because if you have to innovate you know you have to find new ways and, and that's challenged to coach but i i definitely reimagine it like we i was with the arbeis under 14 and um, right and 2 3 years ago and we had seven championship matches in seven weeks actually in eight weeks and in the middle we had um we had a fail and i i think that's way too much competition on top of people and i i don't want to rush to competition when we go back to sport um development um develop the skills the coach the individual um work on their the we we have weapons and work on things they're good at things they're working on really be able to develop the player and i think sometimes competition and we shouldn't let competition get in the way but human nature allows it we rush to performance when competition gets in our way so the learnings i would have taken is yeah you know how can we give them the capacity to access the game long term that has to be meaningful individual uh coaching uh, instruction and help and i think before prior to it we had kind of lost a bit of that and i, I definitely think it's something we're going to reimagine and and if the, if the if the structure of the competition doesn't suit us well, well, so be it and i know even and there's a big thing we, we would have worked pretty hard to, to bring two teams to under 17 and i know we went to we, we've tried to ask to get two teams into the 17 and uh, they said no <laughs> but uh, we said this has to happen this is not an option so maybe they have to look at themselves there a bit too they think it's going to be too complex but uh, the purpose of sport is to bring as many people together in a healthy environment and from it will emerge different you know we've seen the all stars there and the players of the year late developers so um that piece of team developmental coaching is it's fascinating and and um i'd say it's about 8 years ago i was up in Vincent hospital right to um, talking and um, to very very smart people about the role of coaching in sport and society and um against things like mental health obesity uh, depression all these things and back back then it was only theories of mine but now i know it to be true and and we know it to be true the coach um good coaching gives everybody a chance sport is a vehicle to get better at life and and that's our challenge as coaches and the organization's challenge then is to allow us coach easier you know allow allow it be easier to coach so providing good competitions uh, at the right time at the right level and and good referees that can can lead that too so our, our opportunity to to really get on top of this is massive and um, because the need for good coaching and good sport is never greater I'd imagine as well, you know, as important as the gable end of the house has probably been in recent months for, you know, training individual skills and, you know, the way you've been able to use technology in order to engage them in every way. I can only imagine what the relief is going to be like when these players are able to get back out physically onto a pitch and to be able to converse in person with their mates, even if that's socially distanced and in small pods to start. It's going to be a huge moment when they can actually get back onto a pitch again. Yeah, I think uh, they're probably all dreaming about it, you know, young people, old people, we all dream, they're dreaming about that. Um I would imagine greatly. So some of the challenges we we gave are, are probably were a little bit dynamic and stuff, you know, hitting the ball against the wall is is okay sometimes. I suppose we would have tried to challenge them and taught them a bit about deliberate practice and uh, how to practice to get better and shared videos with them on on that. I think uh, coaches and I would have looked at this a lot in the last while because I work a lot with coaches. I think we presume that players know how to practice and uh, at home and that's uh, in my experience and even last week I was helping adults uh, uh, practice. Uh, I think that's something we got to teach people how to practice. So deliberate practice is a good bit of research on that and I think uh, 
we would have tried to give them articles and uh, YouTube videos showing them how to practice and, and maybe a little bit of the research. So it's always that the coach is always trying to educate a little, little bit and inspirate. And I just find at the level of, of, of teenage that they're really hungry to learn. They, there is a, a want there. And I think as coaches, our challenge is just to be able to fan that flame and, and to create that environment from, from where it will emerge you know, I think we, we gave our boys the opportunity to ring um, our athletic development coach last week, and I think four of them rang him, you know, in, in the space of an hour. So that was that was really heartening for me, you know. Paul, it's really interesting what you say there about competitive matches. Everything is going to be reimagined in some way when everybody's vaccinated and things get back to normal. When sport gets reimagined, do you think that a reevaluation of competitiveness needs to be had from the top down in GEA, where there is a certain level and there just isn't competitiveness allowed, or maybe when it comes to 14s and 16s, maybe less competitive leagues or whatever it may be are implemented to, I guess, encourage the enjoyment of Gaelic games? Yeah, so it really is a com- it, that's a complex area, okay, mm. and we do, we do need to breed competition. There needs to be competition in the environment, but we need to teach people how to win and lose. And to teach someone how to do something, you need to ha- kind of need to know how to do it yourself. So the first place we need to start is, can our coaches and our parents understand that uh, uh, this journey will involve winning and losing? So we need to get a frame around what winning is. So we would say winning is uh, what's important now and losing or a loss is learning opportunities to stay strong. So as adults, we have to um, understand the role of winning and losing. So competition is important. But when we rush to performance and, and lose development, that's where we get we get a problem. I think too much competition. So we get the balance. It could be like a, you might be training one to one game to match, and there's not enough opportunity for developing in there. So it's not that competition is bad, and that's definitely not what I'm saying, or, or keeping scores or anything. It's the environment in which it's done. It's the respect for the referee. It's the standard of the referee. You know, it's the decorum and etiquette of, of, of the coaches on the sideline because we have to, if they want to access the game long term, it's going to include joys and disappointments. And what they learn to do, they learn by giving the opportunity to, be, to do. So we have to give them that opportunity. I definitely think the balance can be wrong. We rush to performance. We bring them to games and uh, we make them feel bad about losing subconsciously, obviously. So I think early on, I think... Um, I think we're not too worried about that. I think uh, uh, was it someone explained it to me recently about it's like a zoo. When we have them in our coaching environment, we're in a zoo. But every so often we need to go out into the wild. So we need to make sure that we're doing the right work in the zoo so that when they go out into the wild, um, they're, they're ready. But we don't need to put them in the wild before they're ready. So we need to have a very clear purpose for the competition and what we want to achieve from it. And uh, they need to be ready for that. But I think there's possibly too much competition, depending on how we're viewing sport. If we view sport as something for everyone to come and play, over competition will kill it, because it's it's just a rush to the end, to the end point, get it done, win. But if we un, if we reimagine how we compete, um, to strive together is is the Latin, isn't it, for competition? Mm. I think. So, yeah. I I appreciate this is probably more complicated than just an age question. But if I were to ask you, is there a perfect age at which to introduce competition to a sports playing kid? Is there one? Do you have a theory on that? Um, do I have a theory? I, um, I probably need to uh, think a bit deeper. But um, I competition can be going up the, up the, up the road, playing your neighbours, mixing up. It can be going to different schools and playing different teams and, and mixing it up. And keeping the scores, I have no problem with that. Um, we want application, intention. That's what we want in sport, you know. So when are they ready for that? I think there's probably a lot of egocentricity going on till they're eight, nine. I think nine, ten, a little bit. But definitely no big competitions, no big cups, no big anything like that. We want them to get to love the game, the joy of the game, not for winning or losing, just to experience it. So we need to create them environments. And lots of things have been tried, and there's been a lot of improvement, goal games and everything else. I don't know I'm giving you an exact answer, but I don't think there has to be huge amount of competition. And I think if we understand developmentally, maybe mix it up 10 small-sided games, very, very, 
very well led by coaches. And I'm sorry if that's a poor answer, but it's my I haven't thought deeply enough about it. Sorry. Not, not at all. It's been, it's been great chatting to you this morning, Paul. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, they, people can check you out, I presume, uh, online or on social media? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a website there, Carver Coaching Framework, and then I have uh, social media. What is Carver underscore coaching? That's, that's me. I try and help as many as I can. I, I fundamentally believe that coaching in sport is, is, is an important pillar of our society and ever more important. And that uh, when we get coaching right, everybody has a chance. And it, it's, uh, I think, how, you know, the weaker and how we treat them all is really important. So uh, I'm, I'm passionate to help there. So give me a shout. All right. Paul Kilgannon, thanks a million for taking the call this morning. Long live the revolution, boys. Well done. Uh, Paul Kilgannon there on the line, creator of the Carver Coaching Framework and also, <clears throat> excuse me, author of a couple of books. Right, from March the 11th, Golf Weekly is moving to Patreon. If you sign up, you'll get a guaranteed podcast every Thursday and extra episodes around the biggest tournaments of the year. And there'll be interviews with golf's biggest names as well. You'll also become an official friend of the pod. We'll be able to chat to the lads, Joe, Nathan, Peter, Fionn, get invites to our golf days as well. And you'll also enjoy exclusive watch parties around the majors. You can get on to odbsports.com forward slash golf weekly and sign up now for $3.99 a month or just search Golf Weekly on Patreon.com, and that page is live right now. Right, it is a quarter past nine on this Tuesday morning, and a busy hour ahead on OTBAM. We're going to be hearing about a record-breaking weekend for Irish athletics and the spikes controversy with Cahill Dennehy from half past nine. But we are back after these, the directors of the brand new Pele documentary on Netflix. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB. Don't, don't shoot, shoot, don't, don't shoot. shoot. Oh, oh dinged it. Oh! OTB Live Commentary. Never miss the action right here on OTB Sports Radio. Keep up to date with the latest scores on the OTB Sports app. The OTB Sports app. Live score updates straight to your phone. Check out the Boyle Sports app today for details on which football match is getting the no-lose treatment this week. Plus, study the form with our Racing Post Spotlight before watching the action with free live streaming on all UK and Irish horse races. See the Boyle Sports app for full T's and C's. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie 18 plus. I'm Watson. You're welcome to Golf Weekly. Hey, this is going to be fun. Very happy to say you're being captain and, of course, three-time major winner Padraig Carrington joins us. Today's special guest on Golf Weekly is Lee Westwood. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm honoured and delighted. Let's bring in Paul McGinley, who joins us now. Paul, you're very welcome. Shane Lowry, how are you keeping? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Well, I'm as good <laughs> as I can be. The biggest names in golf and Ireland's best golf podcast, Golf Weekly, now exclusively available on Patreon. Go to OTB Sports dot com forward slash golf weekly to sign up now calling all builders joiners plasterers and dry liners need advice on the right materials for the job consider it done you need them on site and in your hand consider it done you want access to over 10,000 products from the leading construction brands without having to start up the van consider it done there's another way of doing things e-tag we talk with you to solve your problem and deliver what you need directly onto site no second guessing no seconds wasted click etag.ie OTB AM with Gillette put your best face forward with our new and improved razors okay so on the 23rd of February the brand new Pele documentary is coming to Netflix David Trihorn and Ben Nicholas directed it and I'm delighted to say they are with us now Gentlemen, you're very welcome to the show. Congratulations on the brilliant documentary. Uh, David, we, we might start with you, because this is a documentary that is about a hell of a lot more than just Pele, the footballer. However, one of the first things that struck me while watching this was, I have absolutely not seen enough of Pele, the footballer, and if nothing else, reminding the world of one of its true great sports people is an important thing to do. I, I think it was actually one of the first discussions when we talked about making this film. Where we, where we, Ben and I chatted to each other and said, you know, Pele, it's been done. Um, everyone knows the story. And then you dig a little bit, bit deeper and you realize we all actually have this very superficial knowledge of the Pele story. Uh, we haven't really been able to do it justice. It hasn't had the treatment it deserves. Perhaps we haven't seen these wonderful archival moments. But I think more crucially, we haven't seen it in context. Um, 
We haven't seen how he helped build the identity of his country pre-58. No one talked about Brazil as the country of football. Post-70, Brazil is the country of football. And that's largely thanks to Pelé. And um, I think that was probably, probably the driving force behind it. Um, was exactly what you said. Here's a guy where we all think we know the story, um, and yet we mm. don't. So let's actually, let's actually show that. Let's contextualise it, and let's humanise him. Let's see him in a different light than perhaps we're used to seeing him in. I guess contextually, when it comes to the footballer, Ben, it's important yeah. to show things like the 1966 World Cup. It's probably more important to show that than the 1970 World Cup because for genius to exist in a world where everybody wants to kick you, that's not easy. No, and um, it's, something we, it's something we've spoken about quite a lot, that he, he's someone, you know, you know, we never wanted to get into a comparison piece with other players or, or other periods, but in working on the film, it's crazy. His ability to turn up in big moments is, I think, unparalleled, unmatched with any, other, with any other player. And as you say, in 66, he's got this strange way of not only turning up, but creating moments that stay with you, that you can cling on to. So even in 66, when he gets injured, he manages to get injured in uh, an iconic way. So that, that imagery becomes part of this um, kind of mythical thing that he, he's able to create throughout his career. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy the, the, how regular, how relentlessly he is in, in uh, creating moments like that. You say you don't want to get into comparisons with other players, and yeah. I'm really loath to do that. Uh, however, yeah. when we think about Pele and we think about what's happened over the course of just the last month, the conversation around his legacy is a really interesting one. So obviously we had Lionel Messi breaking his record in December, and then Santos coming back and saying, no, 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 you did not break Pele's record. And yeah. there is this strange tone, I find anyway, when it comes to conversations around Pele, where there is a lack of maybe appreciation for him given how maybe pernickety Santos might be in that certain moment and maybe a lack of appreciation for truly how great he was, which I guess is going to be helped by people looking back at this footage that we see in this documentary. Uh, I'm not sure is that something that, that struck you, Dave, for example, over, over the last month or so when this story has been developing? I, I think, yeah, I think he can get dismissed a little too readily. Mm. And unfortunately, every time Pele does get interviewed, he is always asked those comparison questions. And so he will, he will always be drawn into the conversation and then what's, what's often, I think, sometimes perceived as chippiness, I think, is actually, it's his immense pride in what he managed to do, what he managed to achieve, and what he did for the country. He's, he's an extremely proud Brazilian and, ex and extremely proud of his achievements. And, you know, when we initially spoke to him about this film, you, you know, establishing his legacy was one of the key things. Um, as you said, we avoid those comparison points because I think it, it doesn't make sense to compare eras and uh, it, it's not really worth our time. But at the same time, I think one of the things we did say is that, you know, players might end up being better than him. For, you know, Messi could be better, Cristiano Ronaldo could be better. What they can't do is do what he did. He's, he's the first, really. They can't, follow, they can't follow in those footsteps. He's Elvis. He's Neil Armstrong. He's the first guy to actually do it. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that pioneering element of Pelé is, is impossible to replicate. Without question, I, I'd imagine that that's, that's definitely the case. And just one last point almost on the comparisons that I, I just, I, I sometimes find them so hard to avoid, uh, not just with the Messi thing over the course of the last month, but if you go back a month or two previous, when you have the death of Maradona, Ben, I'm sure that's something that almost solidifies Pele's legacy even more. The fact that so many people were coming out and comparing Maradona to Pele after Maradona's death. I'm not sure if it's an insecurity in those that support Maradona in that eternal debate or, or where that comes from. Uh, I guess it's just human nature to want to compare these guys and, and, uh, uh, and highlight the differences between them and, and, and the similarities. But in terms of Pele, I think we felt as he's 80 now. Uh, he's got to an age where he's feeling quite reflective. And we felt it was, it was kind of now or never to, uh, to try and help him cement his legacy as, you know, to help kind of crystallize what he, what he did and why he's different to all the rest of these guys, you know. And um, like all good docs of this style, we wanted to create the feeling that you're uh, living or reliving his story with him so that we can get, if we can get Pele in the room and people that were with him at that time, uh, I think we can show, show why his story is different and, as David says, why he is the first and why that life can never be lived again. Was your sense that Pele was a happy man when you interviewed him? Yeah, very. I think he's, he's, you know, he, he's lived a good life. He has no regrets. 
Uh, we have to remember, you know, we, we time-locked this film between 58 and 70 because we wanted, I think, I think historically it was a, a really good period of history. It was, you know, the, it's kind of the birth of Pele and the birth of Brazil as a modern country at, at the same time, these two parallel stories. Um, and we were getting him to try and remember things that were 50 or 60 years old. It's always quite tough. Um, I think in, he comes across as very reflective in the film, which is perhaps a side of him we haven't seen before. He's, he's usually very jovial. I think there's a very uh, important line at the end where he talks about the relief. And I think we'd usually expect, uh, the, you know, the, the biggest uh, trophy you receive is, is, is actually the relief. And you'd expect Pelé to be talking about happiness and joy. And, and we actually get him sort of uh, going quite deep and reflecting internally. Um, but, yeah, he's, he, he, like, he still lights up the room. He still has that aura about him. And I still get the feeling he, he's... You know, he's a Brazilian. He, you know, he's, he's, he's happy in the sunshine. He likes wearing his T-shirt shorts and flip-flops. And he's, uh, he, he's having a good time still. I think the fact, the fact that he is so normal is one of the craziest things in a way. I and I think that maybe comes back to this idea that what he does for Brazil is so profound a number of times through his life that he uh, is somehow able to create this kind of Pelé character that gets him through the different, the different aspects of his life, and he's, he's come out the other end somehow uh, quite a happy man. What he did for Brazil is a really interesting discussion point. Uh, the mongrel complex is something mm. that's covered really well in the documentary. This idea, I guess, of cultural inferiority that Brazilians had, and I'm, I'm, I, again, I'm kind of reluctant to use that in the, in the past tense. Uh, if we do go back to, to where that perhaps came from, first of all, Ben, uh, mm -hmm. this essentially starts when Uruguay beat them in 1950, right? The, yeah. the, the, the Mongrel complex. They beat them, uh, yeah, they beat them, yeah, in a final, they were kind of almost presumed to win to a crazy extent. Uh, and it kind of, it's the kind of definitive disaster of Brazilian history, really, in, in, a, weird, in a weird way. Um, so it's a country that up until then and after, especially after then is riddled with self-doubt. So when Pelé arrives on the scene in 58 and says, you know what, forget what happened before, give me the ball, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of this. As I said, it's such a profound moment that he instantly attains this mythical status. He's been called the king at 17 years of age. He's a symbol of a new Brazil. Uh, so what we quite liked was this idea that after that, his life kind of syncs up with Brazil. Uh, so when he's feeling good, Brazil's feeling good, and vice versa. Um, and, it was, and it was kind of, the, the task was how we, can, how we can tie them together so that by the time we get to 70, there's a question in the air about, can Pelé get it back? Can Brazil get it back? Can they remember what they did in 58, what it represented? And can they, uh, can they, re can they bring that back and show what it means to the people and remind the people what Brazil is all about? Uh, and it's it's a rubber stamp on the legacy, basically. If, if, if Pelé doesn't win 70, if Brazil don't win 70, then Pelé doesn't become Pelé. He doesn't become that immortal sort of myth that we, we, we've come to recognise. Brazil doesn't become the country of football, perhaps, that we will see it as today. So I think that that, that was the crucial thing of the climax of 70 is, you know, without this, uh, you know, everything from cultural national identity starts to disappear. Mm. How much did Pelé actually go to getting rid completely of the mongrel complex. Uh, it, like, it does seem that this came up again in 2014 when they hosted yeah. the World Cup and they had their disaster against Germany, that I felt that that sense of national inferiority was very much uh, in vogue to talk about at that time. So I guess Pelé helped to keep that beast down for a little while rather than completely eradicate it. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. I think, I think the 7-1 is, is in Brazil likened to the, the defeat against Uruguay in 1950. Mm. Um, but I think what Pelé did was create the uh, notion of Brazil can be successful, Brazil can be a great success, and Brazil can be the best, and they can be better than the Europeans and all the rest of it. And I think that that's always a source of pride for Brazilians to be better than the Europeans, and that's what World Cups can represent. You know, it's not they can win the Copa America, that's fine, but winning the World Cup is far more important. Um, so that pressure is always going to be there. Uh, I don't think. I don't think Pele necessarily eradicated the mongrel complex completely, um, but he did certainly create a nation of, of success that believes in its own success. So when Brazil do fail, I think in, in um, current tournaments, it's less about this thing of, can we ever do it? Can we, can we ever be that country? It's, it's much more about, 
replicating, I guess, the great eras of the past. Yeah, and he, as we said, he's someone who just does it time and time again. You know, we don't go have time to get into it too much in the film, but in the 62 Club World Cup final, Santos against Benfica, that is South American football trying to show European football who's the boss now. Uh, it's a two-leg final. Pelé scores twice in the first leg and a hat-trick in the second leg. You know, you, you don't get much more definitive than that. He just, he, he's able to just, he's able to just cast away all their doubts and just, uh, you know, smash down the door. I must say one of the most remarkable moments in it, and it comes up a couple of times, is when he's sitting with his shoe shining stand and uh, play, playing the drums on it, basically. I'm, I'm sure everybody who uh, watches it is going to come away really affected by that. Is that his? Is that, is that his own shoe shining stand that he's kept for a long time? Uh, or uh, where did that uh, idea come from to actually bring that into the film? His, his own one's in, a, in, a, in, in his own museum in San Francisco, yeah. but it's, it's, a, it's a replica of that. And we, we actually, it was something we did on a, I think our very first shoot with him, wasn't it? Yeah. And we saw so representative of, of again, once these, once these figures attain a certain fame, uh, and, a, and a certain myth to them, we, we do forget where they came from. And I think by showing him sort of just playing the Brazilian beat on that shoebox, we don't need to say anything more. We, we, we know instantly, we recognize instantly his humble upbringing. Um, you know, this is a guy who came from a very poor background in what was essentially a third world country at the time to become one of the most famous men on the planet and, and, and perhaps one of the only surviving icons of the 20th century. Um, and I think it's just a reminder of kind of the roots of Pele, um, that ultimately this is a guy who, he's, he's Brazilian, he's, he's black, he's come from a poor background. Um, he probably had, a, everything was designed for him to probably fail in life. Um, and, yet the heart, uh, and yet he succeeded where so many others didn't. But yet at the heart of it, he is still that guy. It's funny, yeah, we, we, had a, we, had, we definitely had a version or a few versions of the ending where we had him kind of trying to sum everything up and, you know, I've got no regrets and all the wins, all the losses, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but in the end, we decided just seeing him with the shoebox speaks so much louder to where he's come from and what he managed to achieve and how amazing that all is. Yeah, it was brilliant. Really, really brilliant way to end it. Uh, just one point on the people that you spoke to about Pele, his mm. former teammates, those that knew him so well. When it comes to Pele's politics, are they by and large very forgiving of how apolitical he was in an unbelievably turbulent time for Brazil as a country? Um, I don't necessarily think forgiving, because I think, you know, we, we actually have journalists and players uh, leveling those criticisms at, it, at him. And, you know, Pele is a human, he's flawed like the rest of us, and it was our duty as filmmakers and journalists to, you know, explore those flaws and put those questions to him. I think there were a couple of things it was important to remember. It's, you know, he was 23 when the military dictatorship came in in 1964. We, we always regard him as an absolute veteran of the game by 70, but he's still only 29. <laughs> and I think the main thing with Pele is that he, he came through in the 1950s. He's, he, as Ben and I have often said, he's like, he's like a, um, a star of the sort of Hollywood studio system. He's an old-fashioned star, star. He's about magnetism. He's about smiling at the cameras. He's a sort of magazine cover. Uh, and that works perfectly in, in, the, in the early years, in the rise. And I don't think he ever quite catches up. Uh, when the 60s become a bit more radical, I don't think he ever quite catches up to the extent that he should be making a stand. He should be standing for something. And you know, we, we can't speak for him and, and we can't necessarily label that as a criticism, say that he should be radical. No other players were standing up. No other players were um, going out against the Brazilian regime. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think people are happy to criticise and it is probably one of the main criticisms levelled at Pelé that he, he is apolitical or he is a little bit establishment. Um, but it is something we definitely want to approach in the film and, and let the viewer kind of make up their mind as much as anything. I think it's a bit of, I think it's a bit of, as they've said, he was such a 50s guy and that worked so well. And what the, what the, what people wanted from a star at that time, he was able to deliver week after week in just an unbelievable fashion. When what people, when what the public started to want from a star became slightly different in 64, in 64 and around the world, people like Muhammad Ali started coming around. Uh, so it's not so much the Pele changes, it's what, the, it's what the public require from their stars maybe slightly shifts. And then he is suddenly out of step for the first time. So uh, he obviously at some point, for better or worse, rightly or wrongly, makes a decision to stick with the plan, stick with the program. I'm going to keep on going how I've been. Uh, but maybe he's caught out a bit there uh, because of that. 
And I think it's well communicated in the piece as well that Ali and Pele are essentially in two different setups as well. The fact that one is a dictatorship, one's not. I, like, I mean, yeah. not everybody's going to become Muhammad Ali, and that, that is probably the outlier, and it is very unfair to judge him by that. Um, mm. One one final point then on this. Uh, has Pele seen it? Is, is he happy with it? Does, does he like the sense of legacy that this is probably going to bring in a few new eyeballs on his career? We, we have no idea. Uh, right. <laughs> I think we, we've asked his, uh, you know, he has, a, he has a very small kind of team of people around him and we've talked to them and I think we, we said, that I think they were struggling with the technology or something, which sounds right. I think Pele would be happy for us to say he's not the most technologically uh, sound person. <laughs> um, but yeah, we still don't. We I, I know he's watched the trailer, and I know he's watched little bits, and 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 from what we've been fed back, everything's been positive. But we don't actually know if he's watched the film yet, or, or what he thinks of it. Hopefully, he likes it. <laughs> I think he will. I think he will. It's it's brilliant. It's out on the twenty third of February. It's called Pele, and you will be able to get it on Netflix. David Tryhorn and Ben Nicholas directed it, and you've been listening to them for the last fifteen minutes or so, gentlemen. Thanks very much. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Yeah, the 23rd of February is today. So uh, that is available right now on Netflix and it comes highly recommended. And Will, this is like one of those boxes that every athlete now needs to tick. tick. Have you got the documentary treatment? Do you have a work of art about you in factual documentary style? Maradona got it a couple of years ago. Michael Jordan obviously got it this year. And now it really feels like Pele's got one because I don't remember a good Pele doc being made at any point in the recent past. No, and like one of the things we were always kind of dipping into the nostalgia over the last year, and a lot of people probably watched the official FIFA videos which went up. I know that they were on, for anyone who had Amazon Prime, they basically put up the official FIFA videos last summer and they were a great watch and Pele had kind of such an impact on so many of the World Cups across his career but particularly you know 58 and 70 I think I watched the 70 uh, one once or twice last summer and like Pele even though I suppose everyone kind of remembers Maradona as being the great artist on the pitch Pele is just a remarkable talent and that he saved many of his uh, biggest displays for the biggest stage is what really kind of marks him out and as a result, I think uh, you've sold it to me now at this point and the two directors you were speaking to to flick on Netflix later because one of the benefits of doing some morning YouTube is that you've got the afternoon off. So no doubt I'm going to sit down <laughs> and watch Pele. And the thing is that is the likes of the Maradona documentary and also um, The Last Dance particularly, it's raised the bar in terms of the expectation level that we have going into these documentaries too. So they are extremely artistic now when they come out. And I think as a result, it is going to push the bar up for those that are made in the future. Uh, but Pele, one of those people, you know, completely deserving of getting this treatment and allow the debates to go on privately about Maradona versus Pele and then eventually Maradona versus Cristiano and Messi. But let's not take away from any of their individual ability. Let's just say they were the best players of their era then. Yeah, like in that conversation, you can tell that the director is are very, uh, they're not keen to, to, to talk about the comparisons with Maradona whatsoever, but yeah, at least you can say that Maradona started it, uh, mm. the, the, or the Maradona fans started it uh, around the time of his death, that uh, com comparisons with Pele became very obvious at that point. But you're right, like the uh, idea of the, the good quality documentary is something that's very much at the forefront. Like you, you can add maybe the, the OJ documentary to that as well, won an Oscar. And I feel sometimes that we're living in a golden age of sports documentaries right now. And uh, it's a rite of passage if you're, if you're a legend to get a really good one. This one, Pele is obviously interviewed in it. A lot of his former teammates, uh, managers are interviewed in this. It is a, a really good insight to him and also to the attachment between that Brazil team of the 50s, 60s and 70s and Brazil as a nation. And it is impossible to separate the happiness of the nation with the success of the football team. And it comes all the way back from that shock defeat to Uruguay, all the way through to Pelé being kicked off the pitch in 1966. I'm not quite sure if any country has such a connection to its own sports team as Brazil does to its football team. The mood of the nation literally depends on the success of the football team at the World Cup. And that, that pertains all the way through to 2014 as well, when uh, the mood of the nation perhaps still hasn't lifted after that. But it is out now, it's on Netflix, and it is brilliant. Uh, Willow Callahan, thanks a million for joining me this morning. My pleasure, Owen.
Uh, OTB AM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Uh, we're not going off air just yet. We've still got good stuff coming your way from Cahill Dennehy. But just to tell you that tomorrow morning, we're talking Champions League with Graham Hunter. And we're going to continue our build-up to the Six Nations weekend because uh, we're going to be joined by Stephen Ferris as well, I should mention, on Thursday. And we're going to be joined by Alan Quinlan and Ronan O'Gara on Friday. And more on that tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be crossing over to Perth as well tomorrow to chat to Ashley McCarthy of the West Coast Eagles. And we're also looking at Irish football, how we are shaping up a month out from the World Cup qualifiers beginning. Right now, though, we're bringing you a brilliant chat with Cahill Dennehy. He joined Joe to chat about a record-breaking weekend in Irish athletics and how it all came about. Now then, you're very welcome back. So a story which has caught our eye, Irish runners, in particular the women's 800 metres group, are setting all sorts of records at the moment. The Irish indoor record has been smashed twice in the space of a week. There was Nadia Power last Wednesday, followed by Siafra Clary Butner over in Arkansas. All of this with the Irish team in Poland for the European indoors uh, next week. And in the past week alone, five different Irish athletes have posted the five fastest runs in the history of the indoor event in Ireland. Um, and it seems as well that the uh, rankings when it comes to this uh, 800 metres are off the charts. So four of those athletes, uh, Seafra, Clary Butner, Nadia Power, Georgie Hardigan and Louise Shannon are inside the top 20 in the world rankings, which is more than any other country in the top 20. To so to explain all, we're joined by Carl Dennehy of the Irish Independent, the Examiner, the Guardian and beyond. Carl, thanks for joining us. Most welcome, Joel. Great to be on. So we'll broaden this out because I know the issue of the super spikes is being much discussed in athletics at the moment. But the Irish 800 metre women, they're on fire at the moment. What's going on here? They are certainly on fire. Um, I think you can certainly attribute a little of it to the super spikes. It'd be unreasonable to say it's got nothing to do with shoes. But on the flip side, I think you'd be going too far to say it's only down to the shoes because there's a lot more going on here. Um, the standard in general has been going up in recent years in Irish athletics. Coaching is better. Um, I guess people like Kieran McGeehan have paved the way, sort of inspiring other athletes really to prove that it's possible. Mm. And I think it's a completely unfounded theory, but I think lockdown has actually helped a lot of athletes. A lot of these athletes are in college. A lot of them work full-time jobs. Like uh, Louise Shanahan, I was speaking to her today. She was She's uh, studying for a PhD in quantum, she's quantum physics over in Cambridgeshire. And she just says, you know, they're not in the lab. She's at home all the time. Uh, Georgie Hartigan, the athlete who qualified um, for European indoors the other day, she works full time with on running. And she says normally, you know, her normal life is running around the country over in England, visiting different running stores. She says all the stores are closed most of the last year. So she's just at home. And she says because of that, she's recovering a lot better from sessions. She's resting a lot more. And I think that's the case for a lot of athletes, really, that especially the non professional athletes, obviously, for your Kier McGeans life is as it always was really their full-time athletes but for a lot of the other athletes kind of slightly below that standard the kind of 201 202 203 women a lot of them are full-time or a lot of them are full-time jobs yeah. or in college so without any of the other distractions their sole focus really is running these last I suppose, six or eight months and i think we're starting to see the effects of that as well but yeah no denying i think that uh, shoe technology is also driving this progression in times. Yeah, for sure, and we'll definitely get into that. But to have four in the top 20 in the world rankings at the moment, that seems outrageous for Ireland and certainly like way ahead of anything we've had in history. Is COVID in any way skewing the rankings, maybe fewer meets happening, or is this just where they genuinely are in uh, the global sport? It is skewing it a little in terms of a lot of other jurisdictions. Well, as we've seen, even Ireland didn't have any races for the last few months. And that's the case in a lot of other countries. But I think really in Europe, I think things are almost normal. You know, pretty much every high level European athlete is racing this indoor season. And that's purely because the European Indoor Championships are next week. Mm. A lot of other jurisdictions like in Africa, you know, in America, South America, a lot of them don't have those kind of big regional championships to look forward to this spring. So a lot of them are taking their time a lot more and they're sort of, I suppose, just putting in the training blocks ahead of the Olympic Games and the outdoor season. So there isn't that same pressure as there is for Irish athletes where, as we saw, there is such competition for places at the European Indoor Championships among Irish athletes that they really did get after it this indoor season. So yeah. I think as, but I mean, even taking that into account, you know, it's astonishing how many Irish athletes are now up there on the European list and on the world list. I mean, we've got four in the top 20. 
Um, I think with two in the top 10 there, and even Isild O'Donnell, the fifth best athlete, with a 202, was also in 26th place in the world. So it's an astonishing progression in depth. And I think you, you do have to credit, even though we'll obviously get into the shoe technology, yeah. you have to credit the hard work of the athletes and the coaches who are guiding it because it really is the, the rising tide that's lifted all boats. To the point where we see, we, for instance, to uh, extend the 800 metres conversation for a moment, to the point where we might see one of these athletes in an Olympic final, or am I getting way ahead of myself there? Uh, I think you're getting a little ahead of yourself. Right. I, hate to, I would hate to burden them with that expectation. Yeah. Because no, you see, it's I just like, it's, it's actually kind of hard to get a sense of where they are. So it's, it's, it's you know, that, that would be, I suppose, the, the ultimate barometer. So it's, it's, it, we're not quite saying it's that off the charts. Not quite yet. I think for Olympic final, I mean, the 800 metres has been skewed, I suppose, by the presence of the DSC, the differences in sexual development athletes in recent years, whereby a lot of those athletes were running kind of 154, 155. But I suppose the rules have changed and they're now unable to compete at 800 metres. But even still, if you take them out, the best in the world, someone like A.G. Wilson, um, would be running about a 155, 800. And probably to get into an Olympic final, you're talking, you want to be able to run 158 at minimum. Right now, obviously, Kieran McGee is the only Irish athlete uh, who's gone below two minutes in history with a 159 last summer. Mm. So I think if some of these athletes could creep under that two-minute barrier, which you'd expect them to really outdoors, get into the 159 territory, then maybe they're on the fringes of an Olympic final. But uh, okay. I wouldn't want to jump too far ahead just yet. No, no, that's good. That's good to get a sense because actually it's unfair if we have unrealistic expectations of our athletes as well. So I, I just want because we're seeing all these records crashing. You're thinking, what is going on here? And four in the top 20 of the world. And again, I hadn't realised it was slightly skewed with COVID. So it's it's good <laughs> for you to put everything in context. On the issue of the shoes, then. Uh, we've talked about uh, the uh, massive improvements in shoe technology on the show numerous times, like the Nike Vaporfly, for instance. Uh, 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 transformed road running, you could say. If, I mean, if we're talking like a 4% differential, that's transformation when we're talking about the, the finest of margins. So that's road running. We're now talking about the shoe technology jumping ahead massively on the track, so hence super spikes. So what's going on? How new is all this technology and what's been the impact? Um, it's been massive really, but it's been a lot slower than it's been on the roads. So on the roads, it showed up first in 2016. Nike built its Vaporfly shoe and back then it was still only a prototype. And really when, when, what went on then, a lot of people see as, I won't say criminal, but certainly it was by the law against uh, the law as it was written at the time by the IWF, formerly World Athletics, which said that all shoes used in competition needed to be freely available. That was not the case with the Nike Vaporfly. Nike had this prototype in 2016. It gave it to its select handful of elite athletes before the 2016 Olympics to be obviously be up there in the right. Olympic marathon. And then it was the following year where they did, I guess, the big launch with Elliot Kipchoge's attempt to run the sub two hour marathon. And after that, it hit the mass market. So really the rules were being broken back then by Nike, but to be honest, that is a rule that was never properly policed. And a lot of brands over the years, it's not just Nike, they would have had athletes running prototype shoes. But then in the years that went by, once all athletes had access to that road running shoe, we saw the, tum the records absolutely tumble, you know. 4% is said to refer to the difference in running economy, which in the real world translates to about a, probably about a one and a half, two percent 2% improvement in actual time. But that in itself is colossal. You're talking about between, I'd say, one and three minutes off your marathon time, which for the elites is massive. Um, on the track, we didn't see this technology show up really in until about 2019, I would say. And I remember being at the World Championships in Doha and just standing beside a couple of athletes in the mixed zone. There were some athletes walking through and we were looking at their feet and just going, what in God's name are those things? And so what I, we're referring I, I, to- I've never yeah. seen a pair. What's, what's so mad about these things? They're kind of, I suppose, spike place normally would be quite flat and sing, a single plane. And then Nike in 2019, they brought out the victory spike. And the victory was no spike, but they brought out a new version of it for the middle distance that had, well, it had a carbon plate embedded in the midsole, which isn't too unusual. A lot of, a lot of spikes would have had plates over the years, but it also had these kind of air pods in the forefoot just right. under the spike place that almost was said to provide, I guess, a, a stabilizing or propulsive effect. And when you add what they had in their running shoes, which was this hyper responsive PBAX foam, it's a very light, but very responsive foam. I guess the best way to think about it in real terms would be like the flubber movie, you know, in terms of that responsive bounce you get out of the, mm -hmm. when you hit it off the ground, it does provide that. 
And it's not just the foam and it's not just the carbon plates because a lot of these spikes don't actually have carbon plates like the, the distance spike that the world records have broken in for the 5,000 and 10,000 last year. Yeah. That's not a carbon plate. It's actually a PBAX. It's a hard plastic plate, but it's combined. And I guess the shoe engineers have figured out in the recent years how to combine these foams and plates at certain angles where they provide just the most efficient way of running possible. And while that wasn't really being seen on the track up until 2019, in the last year and a half or so, I mean, you have to have your head in the sand not to see what's happening. The national records are falling, world records are falling. Right. And if you were to objectively look at a lot of them and compare athletes across the year, right now, Mondo tracks, tracks are produced by Mondo, the Tartan tracks, they have improved a little, but it's pretty much negligible. Training knowledge has improved a little, it's negligible. And if anything, like anti-doping has got much, much better in the last two to three years, so really, you know, time shouldn't be jumping forward like this. The only explanation for it is that we have this new technology and at these feet. And at this point, really, it's undeniable that it's making a huge impact. Right, OK. So I see Nike has the Air Zoom Viper Ply Fly, excuse me, which is very much for sprint. Uh, Mid-range is Air Zoom Victory and the long distance is the Dragonfly. And New Balance are, athletes are wearing prototypes as well. So if you're not Nike and you're not New Balance, are you sort of screwed? For a long time, if you weren't Nike, you were screwed um, and you were been left behind. I would say that was the case up until 2019, um, either on the track or the road at the World Championships. They definitely had an edge in the last couple of years. And that's why a lot of times Nike would have been so protective of their technology, why they wouldn't have, wouldn't have wanted this on mass sale. Because as soon as it is, mm. the other brands are going to be cutting up the shoe and figuring out how to replicate it with their own brands because it is a copycat game. But yeah, Nike, uh, New Balance had its carbon-plated uh, spike released last year. You know, I think Kira McGeehan was wearing it when she broke the national record um, for 800 metres. Um, I think Schieffer would have been wearing that as well last weekend when she broke the indoor record. Mm. Um, Adidas athletes are so far, I suppose, in what you would call old tech. So the women's 1500 metre uh, world record went down there recently to Kudaf Segei, who was um, running, I suppose, the same technology in Adidas shoes that would have been available a few years ago. Okay, but so, so still, Adidas, still possible if you're an exceptional athlete. Yeah, exactly. It's it's kind of not as clear cut as it is on the roads, whereby it's you know yeah. wear them or you lose. But Adidas are building a spike that is rumored okay. to be pretty special, and that would be available for Tokyo. So it might take a year or two, but I think by then most of the brands would have pretty much normalized. I saw uh, Sean Ingle made the point that some athletes will be really high responders to the spikes, and others might only see a small improvement. So you can be lucky or unlucky here. That's one potential issue here. Is there much consternation over what it's going to do to the records of many great athletes? Like, I guess you can you can sort of make the argument if it's if it's a relatively a level playing field currently when everyone uh, lines up in Tokyo, then okay, you know, fair enough. Uh, when, you know, once most athletes have have the same technology, you can sort of live with that. But for instance, is there consternation over what happens if an athlete who's not a patch on Usain Bolt beats Usain Bolt's record, and we all kind of feel it's because? Uh, Bolt didn't have the shoes that the lesser athlete has. Like, where does that leave athletics? Is there much consternation, even at a, a an authoritative level? There is, because I think a lot of people are, a lot of these records are starting to be devalued when they keep falling. You know, it's like that old Irish phrase that something rare is wonderful, and it's becoming less and less wonderful with each of these records that starts getting broken. And I suppose while some records a lot of the people in the sport would love to see broken, like a lot of the East German records or a lot of the clearly drug-aided records of the 80s and 90s. Yeah. There are other records more recently that obviously were by these hyper-gifted athletes, kind of all-time legends of sport, that people, I think, would wince if they saw them being broken by someone and it being put down to a less talented athlete via shoe technology. And what I've heard about that Nike spike, the Viperfly, um, Nike built it last year for the Tokyo Olympics, and it was specifically for the 100 metres, but its its construction, I guess, wasn't deemed legal under the new rules that were announced early last year, and they never submitted it for, I guess, release Aye. because it had a kind of an external plate, almost almost like a like an Oscar Pistorius type blade hanging off the shoe, kind of. And I had heard in testing it had done some scary things to ground contact times, and and that, I was speaking to again take this for what it's worth, it's it's word of mouth, but they'd heard that. It, it gave as much as 0 0.3, 0 0.3 off 100 meter time. Wow. And if you consider that in the 100 meters, whereby, you know, a lot of the best athletes in the world at 100 meters at the moment, 
Now, Christian Coleman's band, anyway, will be running in around the 9.85 kind of region. Okay. If that you take both point three off those times yeah. and that was allowed, it would be a uh, Bolt's record would be very quickly gone. Yeah. But at the moment, it wasn't allowed, but you can be sure that Nike will modify it to some degree this mm. year so it complies with regulations and they'll be out with something quite similar, I'd imagine. So, in an ulterior universe, Bolt ran 9.28 maybe with those shoes, potentially. Exactly, and that's what we're probably looking at. You know, you see Sonia Sullivan getting written off the list, you know, and I think what the, the whole thing has done really is rendered comparisons between eras mm. and different generations of athletes absolutely obsolete. And now I think that's kind of always been the case. You know, if you go back to Emil Zatopek, no one really compared him to Heidi Gabriel Selassie because the tech is just all so different across the eras. But I think certainly in my lifetime, I've never seen a technological jump forward like this, whereby it's not even athletes between 20 or 30 years ago now, it's athletes from five years ago. You just can't right. compare their performances as pointless. So I think we just have to kind of, for better or worse, accept it for what it is and kind of move on and just accept that we're in a new era. Right, so, so, so that is, this is a new era, it's like that. And, and it's unfortunate if you're five, 10 years ago. So the authorities aren't gonna step in and say, well, hang on, actually, we're, we're, we're parking the technology here. You know, golf is sort of trying to grapple with that at the moment. So uh, the IAAF or whoever's in charge, they aren't stepping in and saying, do you know what? Uh, whatever Bolt was running in, that seems about good enough for us. You know, he wasn't getting blisters, it did the job, the shoe didn't tear. Let's just stick with that. They're, they're pressing ahead, I presume, because the Nikes of the world have plenty of influence and they want to sell lots of these shoes. They certainly do. Like, World Athletics came out with regulations early last year, but I think those regulations arrived at a time in 2020 when they were really needed in 2017 because right. there was people in the sport, agents, coaches, who were seeing what was happening and they they were seeing things, you know, to use the old doping phrase that were not normal in mm. terms of athletes' performances, but their suspicions weren't around doping in this case, it was around shoe technology and they raised these concerns, but it took years for limits to be imposed. Um, and when they finally were, I suppose, in 2020, the horse had already bolted and it was too late. And at this point, so many medals have been won and records have been set in this technology there's no way of going back and to right. be honest do you know with the swimsuit or things like that or certain things in golf you know you can you can you can ban a specific brand or something like that but it's such a general technology um in terms of what's driving this is the combination of responsive foams and plates hard plates and the way those two interact to propel the foot forward and that's just, that is a leap in technology that the engineers at Nike and Adidas and elsewhere have discovered. And I think it would be kind of unfair to them almost and to the sport to say, now that it's been allowed for so long, to turn around and say it's not allowed because it's too good. Mm. Because another benefit of this is that it allows athletes to train a lot harder. Like, the, you know, you talk to athletes who train in these Nike shoes and they'll say their calves recover much better. They can hammer a track session and they can come back two, set, two days later and do the same thing. Whereas before, it would have left them in bits for days. Like So yeah. it's improving recovery and it's improving performance. And I think the above net effect of that is that we're seeing some crazy, crazy times and we will continue to. Will we? Okay. And then maybe it'll all slow down again until the next leap in technology. So there might be a state. We, we, so we're headed for an Olympics here. We're, we, we're in the midst of a real state of flux here and, and records will go all over the shop. But maybe in four years time, if there isn't another quantum leap in technology, you won't see the Tokyo record smashed. Yeah, I completely think that's going to happen. And I think people will get over it. We've been talking about it nonstop for the yeah. last two to three years in the sport. But once the technology is kind of equalized among the brands and all athletes have access to, which they don't fully at the moment, but I think in another year to a year and a half, it will have kind of equalized. And then I think the conversation will eventually move on. And I think records will start becoming mm. the kind of more rare specimens they once were. A an interesting kind of development. I was, I'm again, reading that Sean Ingle piece and he was making the point that usually, I mean, athletes can't wait to talk about how great their sponsor is and like the equipment is amazing and you should go out and buy it and, you know, I want to sign my new contract. There's a, I don't know if you noticed this, that this is the kind of the question. There's a, a reticence almost of athletes to harper on about the spikes all of a sudden because they feel like they're not getting their due credit. I'm sure that, you know, they're elite and they're training so hard and all anyone's saying is, well, did you have the new spikes or not the new spikes? So uh, kind of a number of athletes who are breaking records aren't so keen to talk about their sponsors all of a sudden. Yeah, and I, I don't really understand why they wouldn't, you know, but I do understand why they wouldn't because, you know, it takes away from their hard yeah. work, I suppose, or it's seen to, but I mean, it is the perfect opportunity to plug your sponsors, given you actually have a really highly effective sponsor for once, you know, rather than someone who gave you a free car for six months, but... Um, it suggests almost like, like a stigma. Oh, you're one of the super spike ones, okay. 
It is, and there's a lot of athletes I know who were kind of hesitant to, you know, there's one Irish elite I know who ran in 1500, and he, he said that he thinks they give him about two seconds over 1500, and there's another Irish athlete I know who got him as, who got the shoes as a present about a year ago, an Olympian, and she said, you know, she was almost embarrassed to run her 5k PB on the roads in them because she took like 20 seconds off. She said, I don't consider that my PB because it's purely down to the shoes. But I think the net effect, like speaking of that Sean Ingle piece, he spoke to Jeff Burns for that piece, who's a biomechanist over in Michigan. And he's a very, he's a, one of the world renowned experts, I suppose, in this area, because he studied the effect of the shoes. And I interviewed him last year after the regulations came out. And he gave a great line about where this is all going with the records and the net effect. And he said, right now it's awesome. He said, it's like eating a giant bowl of ice cream and it's great. But he said, I have a strong feeling that in the long run, it's going to make us feel like shit. And I think as time goes on, I see the effect of that more. And it's almost like when you look at, you know, American football, the way they change the rules to have more offense. And it, we started getting these games in the NFL where it was like 45 points a team and stuff. And I remember Stephen was saying, you know, it is like that overdose of sugar whereby it's it's all go, it's all records, it's all glam. Yeah. But then if everything is amazing, pretty soon nothing is amazing. And I think the rarity and what was once so special, this world record that someone so rarely ran, just becomes a lot less special. So yeah. I think it will, yeah. But hopefully I think we'll be past that phase in about a year or two. So Okay, these are almost growing pains. And needless to say, there's just a bunch of people who want to know what it's going to do for their 5K time, these shoes. So like, uh, uh, Muggins kind of, you know, uh, blowing hard and doing his 30-minute uh, 5K. Is it going to knock going to knock 15 minutes off that time? Uh, I'd say at 5 minutes, 30-minute 5K, I'd say uh, I'd give you 27 minutes if you, if you oh, drop. So that's, so not, it, 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 for, for an amateur puffing away to knock three minutes off their 5k would it that's serious i mean it's the best form of training you wow. can do is save, save up 250 quid and buy yourself a pair of these i mean Sorry. they all have them now on the roads whether it's adidas asics new balance yeah they all have these carbon plated shoes and they're all about you know i would say time wise depending on how you respond between one and three percent of wow. your finishing time okay i thought you were going to say a few seconds Jeez, these are this is incredible right call denny thanks so much i know you have a piece tomorrow is it in the independent call yeah, I've actually Great. written about it, specifically about the shoes in the Irish Examiner column on that, and in the Independent, I've kind of taken an overall look at the women's 800 metre landscape, okay. including, I guess, a bit of a look at the shoes. Great. Listen, man in demand. Thanks, Carl Denny. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward.